Good evening, everybody. My name is Cameron. <laughs> oh my god. My name is Minecraft, and welcome to Cameron. My head is all over the place right now. It is the year 2023, and the first With the Next stream has started, and with it, we're going to start things off rather slowly. It has been a quite hectic past couple of weeks, and I'd give a summary now, but I'm pretty much planning on talking about it the entire time, so I'm gonna get right into it. I see a star named Dom out there right now, and good deeds do not go unnoticed, popping in with a tier one sub. We, he's been here paying for eight months. What is up with that? That's crazy. For that, I'm gonna put a, oh, not the, not the silver one. I got a crown for things like this. Here's a big old crown for the brightest star that I see in the sky right now, and that star's name is Dom. Hello, everybody. Minecraft is a bit of a comfort game of mine. It needs no explanation. And um, oftentimes I feel like I just have to do things. Um, I don't. Honestly, if you if you ever out there feeling like you have to feel pressured to do a particular thing, um, check yourself. You probably don't need to. More than likely. Um, I will note now, I, I might have to do a little bit of modification to the setup every uh, in a little bit or so. Because currently, usually what I do is I, mo I monitor stream with my Surface laptop here. And actually, I'm gonna pop things in full screen for a moment if I'm doing this correctly. My swap, yeah. So, as of now, this is a Microsoft Surface Go. Um, it's kind of terrible. Uh, I've never really liked this computer, and over time, this thing has started to warp. I'm not sure if you can tell from here, but this screen is, oh, this is the, sorry. The screen is popped out right here. If I shined my light in on the inside of it, you'll see that there's a lithium-ion battery in there that is very, very open. I don't know if you can really see that. Any case, it's kind of swollen, and it's kind of dangerous. And, um, yeah, <laughs> the screen is also cracked. It's cracked now because the battery expanded so much. And this happened, the battery expansion has been happening for quite a while now. I'm not exactly surprised about that. However... However, I will say, um, the, the screen cracking, that happened at the conference, the conference that I was at. So the conference that, uh, the comfort game is Elden Ring for Dom, and probably the battery expanding, you're absolutely right about that. It absolutely is. Um, so I was at a conference called CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, and a bunch of stuff happened. Apparently, the screen ca cracking was one of those things. Dom thinks it's about a $40 fix at most tech places. Yeah, but like, I also have to replace the screen, and the computer's just... The specs of the computer are just not what I need them to be. I'm in the market for a new laptop, if anybody has any recommendations. And actually, I got one for Anna a little while ago. I think it was a Dell something. And uh, I was very, very happy with that. It was a very it was a very good decision for her. She can play her games. She, we've been playing offline. Uh, me, her, and a couple of friends of ours have been playing Deep Rock Galactic recently. I love that game. It's kind, it's kind of fun. It's kind of fun. I think we'll probably stream it at some point in time. It's, it's good. And I don't think it's... I don't think it requires too much... Um, power and stuff to be able to um, to do things. So I haven't been back in Minecraft for like months now, uh, and ev evidently my whole system here is kind of kind of run dry. I have absolutely no steam, absolutely no energy. Uh, so I'm gonna go about finding why things aren't fueling right now um, and start that going again, and uh, I, we'll we'll take it from there. Um, I think the most recent developments have been a peat farm, uh, apparently a tree farm as well. Uh, I see I completely leveled that playing field over there. Got some trees and whatnot now. It's pretty, it's pretty. It's very, very pretty. Pretty just like me. Pretty just like you. We're all pretty on the inside. Okay, so something is happening over here. These birchwood trees are not being chopped down. So something must be happening down here. We've got a bunch of dirt. Oh, but we have no... We do have fertilizer. What is going on? We have dirt, we have that, but we have no fertilizer, but the fertilizer is not doing anything. We're not out of sand, we're not out of dirt. This thing is still functioning? This thing has bog earth, but it's not pumping anything. This is kind of interesting. What do you have in your inventory? You have dirt and stuff in your inventory. Hmm. Let's figure this out. Dom says he's pretty on the outside, too. I mean, we're, we're pretty on the inside, pretty on the outside. Pretty, pretty everywhere. Uh, it was wonderful. I have... Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh, let me show you guys this. This is this is awesome. Over Christmas, Anna bought me a present. And I'm so happy. I was so happy. I actually wore this to my conference. One second. I have it over here. I really want to show this off because I, I, was, I was so, so happy, but I got it. Oh, my gosh. 
It'll make more appearances, I promise you. I have a suit jacket. Fuck it, I'm just gonna wear it right now. I have this suit jacket that Anna got for me for Christmas. She has a matching dress as well. It comes with pants, ties, came from a company called Oppa Suits. And I wore this jacket to the conference. It's got Pac-Man all over it. I love it. It's so cool. Oh my God, I love this. I like, the story behind that, I guess, is we were at a convention one time and I think I saw a dude wearing this exact thing and I was like completely enamored with it. I was like, oh my God, I love that suit. It's bombastic. Where can I get one? And then Anna wound up getting some for the both of us. And I, I was like kind of hesitant to rep it at the conference because I was like, oh, like this is supposed to be like professional. I don't know if this is like something I really want to have. Also, my, I should be over here in this corner because then we can actually see what's going on. Oh, hello, new menu. Incredible. Maybe I should be in the bottom corner. I don't know. I'll stay over here. There's nothing to see in this corner. <laughs> Except for me now. Oh, but yeah, it was great. It, it was nice. It was really nice. And actually, I got nothing but support at the conference for wearing this. Uh, there was a lot of nice comments from people around. There were uh, nice comments from folks at, that came to our booth table. So this is actually pulling out sand right now. Which is good. So it's still doing that. But why... Why does this thing not say it need fertilizer? This thing definitely needs fertilizer. Oh wait, actually. But if it's producing sand, then that means it's functioning, is it not? Hold up a second. No, 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 I don't see any trees being knocked down yet. What is happening here? Usually when I have this thing running, there is a self-sustaining loop of charcoal that circulates all the way around. It fuels some world anchors that keep the world loaded. It fuels these this tree farm and whatnot to make sure that we're constantly getting a source of stuff. And over time, it just stockpiles charcoal. But I haven't been in this for months now because I just haven't had a reason to go back to it. Life's been, just been too busy. Life's been too busy for Minecraft. Can't believe I'm saying that. There is bog earth here. And that's a good thing. What's supposed to come out of here? What's supposed to come out of here is dirt. Bog earth being there is a good thing. It has fertilizer. That is also a good thing. This one does not have fertilizer. That's a bad thing. I should have a thing around here that says that there is or is not fertilizer. No fertilizer means red pipe signal. You evidently have fertilizer. I say two lives may out. I say no fertilizer. So you're saying you have fertilizer. If I take this guy... And I put you inside. Boop. Okay. Interesting. Uh, what's the problem? 80% hydration required. I think we did that. Overall. Manual farms, I see that. No power! Ah! There's no power. Why would there not be power? You are completely empty. It's not nighttime. Let's, let's nighttime it. When I come back in the morning, it should be on. Is that really my issue? If I just waited around, I, it would have been just fine? Is that the case? Is that the case? No power. There's no power. Well, what if I charge up one of your batteries? Boop. Here, take that. Take that and run with it. Are you working now? Yeah, now you're working. Right? Right? Evidently, that was it. Right? Oh, if it doesn't have power, it can't output a signal. Now it has no fertilizer. Now it's the system. Ah, ah, ah. Very interesting. Yeah, this doesn't, it doesn't require a lot of power. It should fill up over time. I believe this is a self-sustaining system here. I have two solar panels up there, and I believe it will charge this enough for um, everything to be full all the time. Odd. I feel like this whole Greg Thick thing is all about, like, making sure that things are balanced in a proper way, and I don't have simulations to be able to determine what the optimal point is, so it's just a lot of trial and error. I feel like, I think the reason why this is kind of like a relaxation game and a meditation game of mine is, like, go back to it every once in a while, and I realize that things are unbalanced, I go back and I fix it, I change things around, I realize I broke one thing this time, or I change it up this time, it's just, like, it's the, it's, I think it's the engineer in me that really wants to optimize and make things as perfect as possible, but I don't think Minecraft, I mean, engineering really isn't an exact science and I, evidently neither is minecraft i think I, I was looking across the uh minecraft subreddit the other day and there was somebody on there being like yeah i want to make a minecraft mod that just re basically generate like simulates the entire world like you can 
it simulates physics down to a level where if you punch a tree, it'll break your hand. But if you do wind up hitting it down with like an axe or something, if there's particle physics and stuff like that. And he was like, I'm offering to anybody out there $120 to make this mod. And the comments were mostly filled with people being like, dude, that's not a... Something like that, you're going to need a lot more than just that budget. And I would agree with that. Okay. This needs more fertilizer. Only $100. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, what the heck? That's like nothing. That's wild. Okay, so now that this thing is outputting wood, the wood will make its way down to the charcoal, to the the coke ovens. They will create charcoal. The charcoal will feed back into the system and start fueling the world anchors after a while. The world anchors will eventually get full, jet renting the world around them, pushing things back into the supply for a surplus eventually when the surplus reaches a certain level which it's not at right now i will turn on the steam generation system again and we will have power once more i don't think we have power right now i'm gonna wind up going down to the mines and just mining a bunch of stuff and whatnot while i wait for this stuff to occur because i think this thing is sustaining again i hope yeah see now it's working I don't know what happened there. Add some extra zeros and you'll get some people to start typing. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm willing to offer $120,000 to anybody out there who wants to recreate the physics of the world. All down to the quantum level in Minecraft. Um, it, it's 50... It's um, In order to submit your submission to have me pay you for the mod, you have to pay me $150. And if I think that your credit is enough, I will, I will start paying you. Um, <laughs> I'm not a licensed physicist. I have three degrees uh top level masters in electrical engineering so i think i know a thing or two about electrons whether you choose to trust me or not is your own is up to your own volition uh, and i wouldn't recommend it please don't trust me the fact that a company has entrusted me had entrusted me to go to a conference is something that constantly surprises me but it was it was really cool and let me think what else do i have to do up here what more must be done up here i have the tree farm going self ah it was the fertilizer I need to remember what the fertilizer thing is. I think what I discovered a previous on some offline play was that the best way to make fertilizer is using calcium, I believe. Oh, this is my storage system here, but does it have power? I don't think it does. Oh, are you going to turn on? Okay, we got a little bit of it. I evidently don't have any calcium. That's fine. Maybe they're in one of these barrels over here. This thing also uses power and whatever little power I have left is. This is probably all the power I have. No, 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 no. Where, where's my power cube? There's a power cube. That is being powered from... Oh, it's being powered from these battery buffers back here, right? You you are the ones with power, and you are good. You don't have power. No, you do have power. Does this tank over here have steam? You got steam? You got steam. Oh, which must mean that the ones downstairs also have steam? Or maybe I emptied them out. You got steam? Ah, uh, you have no steam. That makes sense. What were you working on? If you have no steam, that means you were powering something by the time that I left. And I have a feeling... Okay. Yep, that's what happened. I was creating fertilizer through this bone meal system over here that I apparently filled up to the brim. That... That's on me. All right. I broke my own system. That's cool. It has no power. Of course it has no power. All right, let me get any sticks on me. Oh, come on, there's got to be a lever somewhere. I'm just going to, like, remove this lever. Hopefully safely. Did that break anything? No. And then I'm going to put it here to turn this guy off so that nothing comes out of this hopper so I can let this thing do what it's supposed to be doing. I, I have so much bone meal. Just don't even, don't even worry about it. Get it out of here. Get it out of here. So now you need more power. And the only way that we can make sure that that happens if I add a little bit of battery power to a little compartment down here that's got some medium batteries. Um, and hopefully that is enough for at least one operation. If it is, then it will just stop running completely and everybody will be happy. You were creating, you were creating what I thought you were, right? You were coming over here, pushing things down into the system. The system was outputting Calcium, I assume? Is it calcium? I think I actually set it up. I think offline I set this up to do exactly what I wanted to. We have... Appetite. Ashes. But this thing was for calcium. Yeah, it was calcium. And this requires... Ashes. So, hypothetically speaking, 
if I were to take my dolly and replace this barrel with this barrel, everything will be okay? Right? Right? All right. All right. Hey, there we go. We got we got fertilizer being made. So if we have fertilizer being made, we're going to wind up fueling the farms, both of them up there, to continue the charcoal generation system, make more charcoal, which needs to create enough energy to be able to continue to power this stuff. This is so wild to see. Dude, I love this. Oh, guess what tomorrow is? What is tomorrow? Tomorrow's Tuesday. One of my favorite days of the week because I work from home. Where is, where is this power coming from? This is being powered by this battery buffer here which is in turn being powered by this whole low voltage line, which comes from, from, it's your birthday tomorrow? Oh my God, it's that time of the year again. Well, I don't stream tomorrow. So allow me to congratulate you on your birthday. I tried to switch back to my other screen. Oh, no, no, here's the other screen. I don't have a birthday song. I should definitely create a birthday song at some point. Instead, I will sing for you the birthday song that has graced my existence for about nine years now, ever since it was given to my fiance on her, like, 16th birthday or whatever. It's found in a Disney princess card, and it goes a little something like this. Happy birthday, princess. Today's your special day. We're having a party together. Happy birthday. Princess, bum, 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 bum. Happy birthday, princess. Today's, tomorrow's your special day. Oh, is there more? No, literally, it cuts off at the second. Oh, it just cuts off at the second one? We don't even get a second verse? No, you don't get a second verse. You just did again. Happy early birthday, dog. I love that song. From all of us to you. Here at With an X Industries, we celebrate birthdays around here, and eventually, we'll have a birthday song. However, we don't have enough cash for that. Um... We'll workshop it in our free time, which is minimal these days. <laughs> um, speaking of time that is minimal these days and attempting to do things, I've changed up my schedule a little bit more and I've reflected it in the Discord server and I will eventually update it on my Twitch schedule. I will now be streaming every other Monday um, because I need to find, my, I, I needed to put some time into my schedule for, let's call it content brainstorming. I wanna be able to do more stuff content wise whether that be on stream or short stuff or otherwise and i just don't have time blocked out to be able to think about that stuff so every other monday instead of playing games live or whatever i'm just going to be thinking about things thinking about things offline maybe online might be trying to hang around in the discord server a little bit I, I got thoughts i got thoughts and i plan on acting upon them um if that disappoints people i'm not sorry this is how things must be. I do it for the good of the people. Okay, charcoal is being generated. We have fertilizer that's going. Hopefully it doesn't wind up working against us because technically, if I pull too much from the fertilizer generation system in terms of power, I'm gonna need to start producing power again. But if I don't get to the critical mass of charcoal to produce enough power, it's not gonna work. Hit me up, says Dom, for ideas to brainstorm. He basically used to do sales, so he's kind of great at thinking of ways to get people's attention. Yeah. So that's like, that's kind of that's the, one of the ideas of why I wanted to bring it up, because I know... So a lot of what I want to do is I feel like things aren't very community-focused right now for the channel in general, and I want it to be more community-focused. I had a little bit of like... um. Let me go down into the mines. Let me clear up my inventory, go down into the mines, and then I can mindlessly play games while talking about literally whatever we want to, because that's kind of how this works. I have... Pretty much an empty inventory. I have a pickaxe. I have a laser. I'm full on charge. Let's go downstairs. Because I was reflecting over the past like month or so, pretty much ever since I went to Gen Con, which was a board game convention, that like all things considered, like there's communities out there for folks that do a lot of things, right? There's streamer communities, there's cocktail communities, there's gaming communities and stuff. And like I don't, I mean, me personally, I think of everything's from like a very selfish standpoint. I don't necessarily feel comfortable out there in the bigger communities and stuff. I would much rather, I'd feel more comfortable in a community that is more or less run by myself and other people and whatnot. And so I was like, well, how do we do a community like that? And to be honest, I don't know the answer. I don't know how you really build a community. I thought like, you know, some people are like, you build it over time. It's got to be organic. But like, you know, it's a really, it takes a lot to be able to like get people's attention and really bring people in. I think the biggest thing about trying to build something like that is like making it, like making people trust not making people trust but like earning people's trusts and that's something i want to put more effort into at some point totally feel that 
Because, like, because, like, personally, I know at least that, like, you know, it'd be cool. Like, there are some communities out there, like, for example, I, I'm going to reflect on my experience on r slash bartenders and r slash cocktails. I've tried to share, like, my own cocktail content on there. And to be perfectly honest, whenever I put stuff out there, previously I've had this very, very bad reactions. I don't trust the community there. I've seen other people's communities and stuff, and it seems very elitist. It feels very unfair. It feels very gatekept. And I was like, that's annoying. I don't like that. That's not to say, this does not reflect other cocktail communities that I'm in. It's just this particular subreddit, and I don't like it. And so in this case, a particular community has failed me. It has not earned my trust. It's actually pushed me away from it. I don't need to feel like I need to be a part of that. I can go off and make my own. Trust is a two-way street. People taking chances with other people. You're right. And like that's kind of something that I like. I reflect on like my own relationship, too, because it's, it's, it's a two-way thing, right? You can't expect something from somebody without putting in something. And so a piece of me was like, okay, well, the missing piece here is I don't post enough on these communities. So for example, I'll take Instagram, for example. Like, I don't post enough on Instagram for people to wanna, let's say, hear what I have to say on Instagram. And that's not necessarily a true statement. I feel very comfortable on the Instagram platform. I'm just giving it as an example. But you could, for instance, feel like you're putting, let's say on r slash cocktails, you're posting a bunch, you're feeling, you're, you, you don't necessarily feel comfortable on there, but you're trying to gain people's trust. So all you do is post pictures of cocktails and stuff. And like, that's cool and all, but like if people, if they're not going to wind up, let's say, affirming you and making you feel comfortable, kind of treating you like another person, then like it's not working that way. If I were like, uh, let's say, the most extreme version of myself, a stuck up snotty cocktail mixologist who only says Manhattan should be made with rye and no other way, then maybe I'd fit in that community. But I'm of the type where, at least for the cocktail stuff, that like if, if you like it, then who cares what you put into it? I want to know, like, I was actually at the conference um, that I was at, uh, which was CES, and it was really, really cool. Um, I walked around a bunch. I'm going to wind up digressing about just things and whatnot that I found along the way. One of the things that I found was a, a it was like a cocktail machine. The idea is that it's automatically scans your ID, passport, um, driver's license, legal ID, whatever. It determines what your age is and uses facial recognition to confirm that you are indeed the person that your license says that you are. I have no idea how this thing like actually like accurately, let's say, checks for fakes and stuff like that, but it was a cool concept and it was serving truly. So it wasn't really a cocktail machine. It was just a beer machine. It was okay. But I was talking to this one individual who was hanging around and I, th she was telling me about how, I, like, we were at a cocktail machine. So I was like, hey, I mix cocktails. What what do you drink? And she was telling me about how she's like, yeah, she, she'd made um, recipes on her own. And I was like, oh, please, well, tell me what your recipes are. I want to, like, I want to learn more about it. And I found out about a, um, a, a recipe for a mudslide. A mudslide usually, at least according to a bottle that I have in the back, is like a chocolatey coffee type drink. They usually use some sort of cream liqueur. Um, Kahlua makes their own mudslide liqueur and it's a coffee cream liqueur the idea is you take that you add it with a little bit of vodka or otherwise uh maybe some more chocolatey stuff if you didn't have it in there um and that's your mudslide and you can you can blend it you can put ice in it you can add other things to it i think probably cocoa bitters would probably add a little bit of a different component to that it probably tastes really good and this individual made their mudslides with ensure which at least over here in the states i don't know if it's out there otherwise ensure is a like a protein shake uh, I think it's, I think, I don't know exactly what the demographic is being pushed towards it, but I want to say it appeals more so to people kind of like in their, their, their latter years, because it gets you protein, it's completely liquid, it's got a really nice mouthfeel to it, it's kind of yogurty almost, in terms of, um, I guess the texture. I, I've never had Ensure before, but I've had Boost. Boost is, um, Boost is another, like, kind of breakfast chocolate protein thing in the morning that I have at my parents' house, and to be honest, I've never thought of like a protein shake like that, combining it with alcohol as being like, like a thing. Cause I think like if there was any sort of like health benefits to the protein, then you're completely nullifying it with the alcohol. But people live their lives in whatever ways that they want to. And to be honest, if I was stuck up more the people that I would expect to find in some certain communities, I'd probably be like, I probably would have looked at this person and be like, oh, interesting. Or that's kind of nasty. Why would you do that when there's liquors out there already for you? But I would consider myself rather open-minded and honestly like if you do, if you say that to someone you could wind up hurting their feelings you know and i don't really want to if i can help it i don't want to hurt people's feelings you want a whole city made of bread do i want a whole city made of bread it sounds interesting to have in a cocktail yes bread and ensure protein shake <laughs> what was the what was the bread comment about did i miss that <laughs> uh i would not I, would i like a whole city of bread rye maybe i was making a rye whiskey comment i don't know who knows at this point
if a, if a whole if somebody wind up giving me a whole community of bread buildings made of bread and whatnot to handle i don't know if i would know what to do with myself but i would take on that challenge I wouldn't say that I've done much administrative work in the past, but I feel like if you have a city made of bread, then, um, insert bread joke here. I'm trying to think. Um, bread. What kind of breads are out there? White bread, wheat bread, wheat? What sounds like wheat? I don't know. If you're running contract law in a city made of bread, you better wheat between the lines. But I'm... Or, um... Something what rhymes with rye. What what is rye kinda like? Rye lie. I'm not gonna rye to you about the bread city that we've constructed, but it'd be a wonder bread if you pulled it off. I think the rye comment might have been slightly racially uncouth. But I didn't mean it that way. Yeah, I think honestly, the the idea like that's the, that's another thing too. Like, I think generally I'm not going to specifically say in the engineering community. In any community, not... Actually, this reminds me of... So, I mentioned that I kind of wanted to do the community thing ever since this this um con, uh, this con that Anna and I went to called Gen Con. And we went to a panel at Gen Con that was sponsored by an organization called this Take This. And Take This... Oh, my diamond pick broke. That's okay. We'll be all right. I got all the pickaxes. Um, Take This is an organization that I want to say... And I'm probably not quoting it correctly, but I think the general idea is it provides mental health resources for people, especially those who are being like, especially those who are in the gaming community, perhaps, but maybe I'm sure it extends beyond that. But so at that, one of the things that there were, there were a couple of um, D DMs up there who play D&D &D or GMs up there. There were a couple of psychologists up there for uh, uh, medical professionals. And it was really, really cool to get everybody's perspective and see what they had to say. But one of the things that they mentioned was that when you're in any sort of group, you want to be able to feel like you are safe to share your ideas. And that means like more or less any ideas. For example, let's say that you want to share some really, really weird cocktail ideas and you don't want to feel, let's say, put out for that. A community that is geared to be able to do that. Let's say you're in a community, let's say, for example, like you, there are hard limits in a community, such as like they don't do like racial slurs or anything like that. If you were to breach that, and didn't have, let's say, the context for realizing you shouldn't be doing that. Hypothetically speaking, you walk into a place and it doesn't say, hey, you can't be saying that stuff. Like, some people might feel like, um, I guess kind of, I mean, if you have, like, rules posted at the door, people should know those rules and abide by them. But let's say, like, the rules are a little more, I guess, ambiguous. You might say something that, like, winds up, like, reminding somebody of, like, a past trauma or something like that. But if the community, I guess, is, and again, I don't know too much about that. But, like, if the community is instructed in, in, in such a way, then you can make those comments without feeling like a total bad guy just because you said them. I may say, like, let's say somebody's, like, word that they're very sensitive about is, like, I was reading a Reddit post about this last night. The word is egg. For some reason, for, la for some reason, the term egg reminds you of, like, a past traumatic event. And when you hear the word, or when the idea of the egg pops in your mind, you go, you go like, into this state of, like, like, like nervousness and anxiety. Knowing that, you know, it sounds a little odd to me, it seems a little weird, but like you might walk into a community where everybody feels that way and you wind up saying it for the first time. And if I guess it's, if it's set up in such a way, you're not just going to be like kicked out of the group just because you're just because like you said the word egg, you've been like ostracized it forever. It's not like, you know, the cod lobby mentality where like you walk in, um, let's say you say egg and egg is like the new racial slur out there or something. Um, but like, um, you shouldn't feel like, like just because you made the mistake, that you ruined it for yourself. Or just because you made the mistake, you're now seen as like a lesser individual in those communities. Hypothetically speaking, let's say for instance, you never realized that a certain word out there was a racial slur and you wind up using it in a conversation or rather something that's racially insensitive. Like the other day I was talking to somebody and I was kind of feeling like cheated. And the word that you could use, and I'm specifically calling it out ahead of time here. It's not a very couth word to use, at least in my opinion. And you can say, that you've been gypped. Gypped, as in like you've been gypped of something, you've been cheated, you've been conned out. And gypped, I believe, comes from the same like root of the word as a gypsy. And a gypsy is not really a nice way to refer to people of like kind of the Romani area of the world. I can't say what the other areas around them are. I don't know, remember whether it's a particular like religious sect or something. But like to say that you've been gypped is like kind of saying that you've been gypsied. 
And like gypsied, it's almost saying that like a particular group of individual is embodied by a by an action. That action being taking something away from somebody else, which is a regular negative thing. So the root to me is not it's not very kind. I don't really I don't really like it. And I've been trying to remove it from my speech, although obviously I slip up every once in a while or use it in terms like this because it's not as bad as let's say other words. But so if somebody were, let's say, in the community, they went up using that. I if the community I think is like constructed correctly correctly is a weird word to say because it implies there's some sort of truth to it which there really i suppose there probably isn't some sort of truth there it's, it's a not a one-size-fits-all thing then like it's not like this person is going to be completely kicked out because they said something that they weren't aware of hopefully it's instructed in such a way that like as moderators or people in the community be like hey we're not really cool with that word it's totally okay well, you know you used it you probably didn't know but you know Let's try not to do that again. Let's let's try to learn from this and make people feel more comfortable about it because apparently some people are uncomfortable with the term. It's the real world equivalent to how the Khajiit and Skyrim are treated. Yes, the like in Sky that's a great example. In Skyrim, they're kind of viewed as like these like kind of con folks and whatnot. Uh, if I correct this, I mean, haven't played Skyrim in a while, so I might be misquoting it. Dom could probably do a better job at that than I can. But like the idea, you you know, anyways. But, like, if you make a mistake like that, you should, I think, it, no matter where you are, if you're in a community that has rules laid out, then you should be able to, like, come back from your mistakes. The consequences shouldn't be permanent. If it's laid out ahead of time, and it's just like, yo, don't Paul call people names and stuff like that, and you break it once and it's very strict and you're kicked out, that's just how it is. I understand that. That's the way that that particular community was built. But if you're in another place, let's say a more, a safer community feel a place where it's okay for you to like express your ideas and express your words and your opinions and stuff without being ridiculed or cast aside or downright insulted back and fought with and that's a pretty good community again i have a long way to go in terms of doing my own research on how to best construct facilitate and form a community that now i want to be able to form now that i'm a little more conscious of it but again going forward i hope to be able to spend more time on that and of course the idea that let's say i'm taking time for myself to be able to think about these things is not a very good way of looking at it evidently if you want to build a community it's got to have more than you're just yourself and the idea that you're let's say you're not taking in the op opinions of the people who are already in the community might be might be a little gap in your mentality then a gap in your logic i was like Oh, well, maybe I like, maybe I just take the time and I self reflect alone and stuff like that. I'm like, no, there was another, uh, I watched a lot of like, like content help videos the other day, which I used to feel really insecure about doing before. I'm like, I don't need all this help. I don't need to watch these videos and stuff like that. But I realized, actually, I can and I will and I'll feel okay with that. Um, and one of the other things that I saw was that, um, or what was it? Oh, it's like the idea that like the people who stick around, are the quality ones, right? If you get distracted by, let's say, the number of stuff, like the number of people in a community or the number of people who are vocal, then you're, you're, you're missing the point. It's about the quality of those people. If there are people who are very vocal about it, willing to step up, willing to contribute, uh, because Dom, I know is here right now, has stepped up to be a mod and has been very, very uh, vocal with kind of his stuff in the server. And I've been chatting back and forth with him for a while. And I met him on stream, never met this man in real life. But he's awesome, and I love him, and I think that is does, that's cause to be celebrated. If I were to be like, I want to build a community with you in it, and I don't want it, I don't want your opinion at all for it. You know, you don't. I don't know if you necessarily feel appreciated. If I was, you know, in the company that I'm in right now, we've only got about a dozen people, and to be honest, there there was a time where I wasn't not because I wasn't supposed to be or I was told not to, but I didn't necessarily feel like I was a part of the conversation that was happening. I think that was something that I earned over time. I had to earn the trust uh, with my coworkers and my superior, I say superiors, but it's, it's a loose term. Um, but I earned that trust and now I have a seat at the table and I feel really, really good about it. And I feel that I can almost speak as an equal to the people that I have around me, which is great. We're a very small team. So that kind of openness, that community there, dare I say, is something that I think we've built pretty well. And it, of course it has its like shortcomings but like every community does i remember you talking about that no like seriously and like i feel very very good to be a part of that community but like for example if everyone's if let's let's say upper level c management 
and that's two people, if they were just behind closed doors all the time making all the decisions, that I probably wouldn't feel very good about that. And there are times when that happens because it's a business and sometimes you make uh, decisions on behalf of the company, especially when you're at that level, you take responsibility for it and it makes sense. But there are other times, like right now, um, we're at a point where we're realizing that previously we tried, the, the, the I guess the leadership mentality was we are going to split things into sections and we are going to have people kind of work within their sections with particular leadership potential and they're going to kind of establish goals and stuff and they're going to go now and it's still kind of that way but when we talk about like leadership structures like technically i don't report to anybody else aside from the top dog himself so but who reports to me but like nobody support reports to me and i have other engineers that i work with as well who are on the same team of me but they also report to the same point so technically that would mean that we all get instruction for the top guy and the top guy has to be involved with everything and to be honest it I, I've seen the effect that it has on the people, both the folks that I work with as well as my boss as well. And like, you know, I know from personal experience, especially in college, like you can stretch yourself too thin. And dare I say, some folks stretch themselves way too thin, myself included. And so what we've been doing a little bit more recently is within reason, everybody can kind of go forth and work on their own goals. I think personally, I feel like I have a better, I, a good enough idea of kind of the stuff that I'm working on and company goals and whatnot that I can more or less see where I need to be going with things, what tasks I need to work on sometimes. I'm not perfect, nor would I say that I'm like, I like let's say administrative level, managerial level individual, and I don't necessarily trust myself to take on all those decisions, but I've been given a lot of like responsibility for stuff like that. and. For the most part, the affirmation there is, for the most part, it's not like I've done anything wrong. I've been making progress towards things. I think one of my rewards was being able to be to go to the conference the other day, which was awesome. And actually, I'll comment on that. Pretty much when I first started working for my company, Stell Life, it's a startup here in Philadelphia. I was kind of, I, I was working under a particular firmware engineer and he was very, very smart. He aspired to be like a professor and he wound up leaving shortly after I joined. He was going on, he was going on for other things. And I actually got to saw him at the conference and it was really, really cool catching up with him again. There's another coworker that I work with who's not in this country. I've never actually met him. I had met him at the conference, but he's always been described as being a superstar, a rock star because he's super duper good at what he does. He's an excellent firmware developer. He basically rewrote everything that that made our operating system that we work on like uh, a, a good good product and he basically did it all on his own in like two weeks and that's an insane amount of work and definitely speaks to the insane amount of talent that this guy has and he's very very humble about it and i totally respect that i respect that the hell out of him but so after the conference ended my boss also said like when i said like yo thanks so much for having me at the conference it was a blast an excellent learning experience i would love to do this again he was like yeah no problem thanks for being a rock star and like, that made me feel so good. That made me feel like so prideful. Cause like that was the term that he had been using for a different engineer, an engineer who I hold in very, very high regard. And he used the same term with me. And I, I don't know if it was just like a passing statement or anything like that, but like, I felt really, really, really good about it. And the next time I have a, like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him, I'm gonna end up letting him know. I'll be like that, th th I know you, maybe you didn't mean it that way, like specifically, but like, that made me feel really, really good, and I am incredibly motivated to continue doing what I'm doing here because of, because of that. I think I, I oftentimes, growing up, kind of maybe struggled from, like, a, a validation thing. Like, uh, you know, not necessarily I didn't re receive enough validation, but it almost felt like I was always looking for, like, praise and thanks and stuff and didn't necessarily get it. And that that kind of is indicative of, like, the American health system. Or, I'm sorry, help, whoa. Uh, American school system, college, at least the collegiate system at Drexel University. Aside from positive grades, I got good grades. I'm, I'm not gonna lie about that. But, like, getting good grades was always the case for me. So, like, when somebody said, good job and you're A+, I'm like, yeah, but I always get A's and stuff. Like, that's, this is no big deal to me. I, it's not, it's not enough. <laughs> Dom says he also has a praise kink. I do. I definitely feel, I get, I get, a, like, a nice, good, good feeling. It makes me feel real good when I get praised. I like the affirmation. I, I really, really do. You need to die. You, you, you need to cease existing completely. Thank you for that. But it feels, but it feels, it feels good. Maybe not necessarily in a sexual way, but it feels good to be saying, "Hey, you're doing good. Keep doing what you're doing." Or, or it even feels good to learn as well to be like, "Hey, you were trying here, and I recognize that you were putting in your effort, and that is an amazing thing." However, you were kind of off the mark there, and that is okay. 
Like, we can, we can acknowledge that it is okay that you took a jump, you tried your best, and let's try a different direction next time. But, but excellent, excellent effort. And that's the kind of, the, I guess, in that way, the company is the community that fosters that kind of stuff. I am feeling like I have the comfort to be able to go out there, make mistakes, work on something that I think I should be working on, and spend a little too much time on it to see to, to see if it's worth the results that come up the other side. I think one of the things that I worked on, I, I worked on a really, really big project, like, a few months ago. Honestly, it was back in, like, June or something, where I had to make one of these devices work. And it was very, very it was a very, very complicated task. And I spent basically an entire month of my time working on that. And it took a really, really long time. I learned a lot of lo I learned a lot along the way. It was very nice. I have no torches. I have no torches. I need to go up. All right, I got to go up. Up to the surface world. Where he, How he gets there, nobody knows. I go up. My angle is too... Oh, okay. I need to turn this to superheat, no scatter, not explosive, a mining, low focus, long range. Up! Go get him, buddy. Don't kill me. Is it water up there? There's water up there. Okay, there is water up there. We're going for it. I'm going up. With this jetpack, I can just go all the way up to the sky. It's absolutely wonderful. I don't have to worry about anything. There we go. Nice. Now I can go get my torches and stuff. Oh, am I, I'm in hover mode. Okay. I didn't need to be in hover mode. Where was I going with that? Feels really good to work at my job. But enough about the job. The job sent me to CES. What the heck was I doing at CES? Well, we had a little booth. A little booth at the table. Again, the company I work for is called Stell. And we work, we work uh, in like med tech. Ha healthcare tech. I've been working on my pitch a little bit, so allow me to share that with you now. <clears throat> Stell works on a proprietary operating system that uses a patented passive Bluetooth pairing protocol to be able to communicate with medical devices so long as they have a Bluetooth-capable chip on the inside. You got a blood pressure cuff, you got a pulse oximeter, you've got a blood coagula a coagulation meter, you've got wearable devices like your Amazon Halo Band or Step Tracker. Our device will be able to, any device running our operating system will be able to communicate it, communicate with it, capture that measurement data, securely send it through our backend up to the cloud to wherever it needs to go, whether that is your own digital platform or a hospital's uh, EMR or a patient's electronic health record. Uh, we don't take any personal health information, no PHI, uh, because we send, instead of a patient's ID, we have a little ID on the back of each of our boxes that only you, as the healthcare provider, know the association for. So all the PHI is with you, we're not, we don't deal with any of that stuff, so it's significantly less risk. And you can have faith that you're always gonna be on call with somebody who will be able to support you in your, in your stellar hub related needs whether there were a customer success line or if you need a new device added you talk to one of our firmware engineers who know exactly what they're doing and they'll make it work for you we have over 200 devices so far integrated with our operating system that runs out of a couple of different hardware pieces so far and the list is ever growing depending on what you may need for your solution whether that be your own device whether that be a new device that you want to place in a home you have a particular brand that you want to be able to use and it's not on our list it's not working with our hub let us know request it send us a sample we'll make it work actually the other day um, there's a scale that we work with. Um, a and D is the company who manufactures the scale, um, and they have a different like colored scale out there. I think they came out with a, like a Bluetooth five model, and we've been working with one of them for a while now. And so now we got called that it wasn't working with this other one that has a Bluetooth five chip on the inside. It's a different color. It's white now. For some reason, it's not working. And I've got a pretty good idea of why it's not working. And um, well, I'll eventually get one to be able to figure out why. It's very very cool. Uh, Anyway, that was my pitch. <laughs> and I was specifically told, don't end your pitch with, and that's my pitch. Um, but I'm very comfortable in this space. So that's my pitch. <laughs> Do I have any torches in here? I have quite a few torches. I'm gonna take all of them and conserve some space and storage. I also have a bunch of charcoal and I can go get sticks. So why bother with getting torches from here? I can get it elsewhere. Do I actually have, do I have a torch thing over here? I do not. In any case, that's the stuff that we work on. And we had a little booth there. So the idea is we have a couple of different types of companies that we work with. Um, and we, ha we had a little booth there. It was kind of cool. At CES around my table was a little, it was a di what they called the digital health studio. And it was like this room-sized space with couches and tables from other companies who also do like med tech stuff. 
um moderna was there we had oral b was there the like the toothbrush company um ge general electric apparently has a health division they were there as well in like the same area that we were it was pretty cool um but we also had like the studio space where there was a camera set up there was a little stage we were recording like talks that my ceo was having with other people other companies were having like hosting talks there it was really cool i got to like kind of use my my new pixel camera phone to take video of some of the stuff that was going on because they were going to use the uh the footage for some marketing stuff that we're working on the people who run the convention uh, the conference we're going to put some stuff out there about us too because like healthcare is like a really cool thing and it's really really lagging behind from like a technological standpoint so the push was intended to be like for healthcare um and to be honest there was a bunch of stuff there that wasn't even remotely related to healthcare it's the consumer electronics show so long as it's a consumer electronic it was gonna be at the show and folks like panasonic were there we had amazon was there microsoft was there a bunch of other like small companies that you probably never heard of there was fitness devices on sale there was um like just general home stuff on sale like your google no homes and like um i guess it was i'm sorry it wasn't like on sale i guess the point wasn't that you go there and you just buy stuff you could like so there was some places that were like selling stuff and whatnot but like you go up there and see like the cool new tech i saw um a couple different companies who were doing like um different like like a uh, lactose equivalents there was one that apparently had like cracked the casein pun intended on um like milk-based products uh casein is a protein that i think provides the texture and they can create a casein like protein by instead using fermented wheat it was really, really cool. And we got to try some of their ice cream, which kind of tasted a bit like water ice, if I'm being if I'm being uh, particular there. Um, but it was good. It tasted all right. We had a couple of... It was interesting. There was at least three or four different coffee machines there. Two of them were, I think, supposed to be like novel technology. They were smaller. They were more portable. They were more affordable. Um, but like... I, I, get, I don't know. I don't really know other, other than that. There were also... Oh, there were some other uh, booths that had like just coffee machines there and would make you free espresso and free coffee to tell you about their med tech stuff, which was, was pretty cool. I was able to, I was definitely able to not have a lack of coffee at this conference, which was great. Unfortunately, we were in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so for some reason, I couldn't find a single water fountain there. And the only water that you could find was $4 water bottles, which like you could technically just fill up your water to the bathroom, which is probably fine, but like felt a little weird all things considered. It was very difficult to stay hydrated at this conference. Um, unless you had somebody bringing you water, which, uh, because we are a part of the studio space, they were bringing water that we did have access to, so thank you to those folks who were in charge of that. But it was really, really cool. I think, personally, the experience that I had at the conference was really important to me in the fact that I, I can be a little introverted at big events like that, and I think once I get a rhythm going, like, there's, not, there's nothing that's gonna stop me. Um, and like the rhythm got going and I felt like I could vibe with a lot of different people, whether they were from like hospitals or device companies or those who fall in between people who are not even in that at all. We had engineers that came by, we had doctors that came by, we had students who came by. I think there was a one group of people who came by and they were, um, they were, they were students studying engineering. And I was like, yo, I started engineering too. Let's vibe about that. And to be honest, I don't, I don't think they were particularly interested in what we were doing. And I don't think we, I don't think we hit it off very well. But I felt good about it, and I was happy to vibe with people who were happy to vibe with me. Even if, like, what we did as a company had literally nothing to do with what you were doing as a company, I just really enjoyed the fact that I could just, like, talk with people on, like, an intellectual level. Which, to be honest, you know, again, if you're in the right community, or you go to the right networking events, you can find people like that. And if I were more vocal, let's say, online, I could also probably more easily find folks like that to talk to, because I've been... I hope this doesn't sound, like, too stuck up. I'm a very intellectual individual. I am a rather smart individual, and I've got a good head between my shoulders, and I do a lot to prove that for my own benefit and for the benefit of others. And, like, there's a certain itch that gets scratched when I can, like, talk technical with folks, which is which is really cool. It feels really good to talk about that stuff. It's like, like you know, for example, artists out there, I consider myself a little bit of an artist, but like if you're like a painter and stuff and you're trying to find like new techniques and you just meet somebody on the street who also was a painter who uses a technique that you never even heard of before or knows about this one like art gallery that was right around the corner that you should definitely go check out because it's kind of in your field. It's kind of cool to have those conversations, especially when they're more or less random. Randomness in terms of opportunity like that, uh, this is, a, it's not a quote, but like it's, a, it's an idea that I stole from one of my coworkers. Um, is like, 
and I don't remember exactly what it is, but like the amount of, let's say, luck that you perceive to have is a bit of an equation. It's a little bit of a formula that like technically, let's say the more lucky breaks you have, like, you, you would think that the more lucky breaks you have, the more lucky an individual you are based off of just some unknown variable we call luck at all. Something inherent to you, it could be talent, you might be born with it, could be a product of your situation. There is some variable called luck that you basically have no control over. You are given it, it's a value that doesn't change. And you may think that the lucky breaks that you run into is solely a factor of that one variable that remains fixed. And over time, the probability is associated with that. But we raise instead that there was a couple other variables and the bigger variable there is like, I guess like how open you are, like the amount of, let's say effort that you put in, the amount of doors that you open, hypothetically speaking. If you have a door in front of you that is constantly changing between good things and bad things and you just keep opening the one door every day, you can open this door once a day and if it's good, cool. If it's bad, so sorry. And let's say there's a 1% chance that it's good and a 99% chance that it's bad. If you keep opening that same door, you have one chance a day and the odds are one in 100. Hypothetically speaking, if you're out there, Sag Stan says, what? I'm going on a bit of a philosophical tangent here. I'm trying to conceptualize luck for a moment. Welcome. If you were to go to a bunch of different doors in the same day, and the odds are still the same, still 99% chance that something bad happens, 1% chance that something good happens, you get more chances every single day. And although the probability that something good happens never changes for the doors, chances are if you all open 100 doors, at least one of them is going to be a good thing. So I think the idea is like, and I don't remember what the quote is, something times your luck times opportunity equals your actual luck or something like that. I don't even know. The idea basically being the more chances that you take, the more lucky you might seem to be, or the more doors get open. And like, you know, you might find one door that's like leads to another door that's luckier than the other ones. And you you go back to that one, you have more opportunities and stuff like that. I'm going on a whole tangent here, but the idea is basically that the more open you are about things, the more open you are to like communicate with new people. Let's say each new person in this case is a different door that you're opening, a different opportunity that lies on the other side. You may find something like a find a connection that you never knew possible, or you go down a different website, a different forum that you've never seen before. I have a computer architecture exam tomorrow. Why am I here? Why are you here? Well, if you have a computer architecture exam tomorrow, chances are you might be in college or some sort of school system. And in, if that's the case, if you are a person of learning, this might be a rather philosophical thing that could help you down in your life. I'm also an electrical engineer with, with degrees in both electrical and computer engineering. So if you have questions about computer architecture, I could also try to help you out there. I'm not well versed in particular architectures, but uh, I did take like two graduate courses on computer architecture, one undergrad course, Basics up through advanced. Um, and I work with Nordic Semiconductor ARM chips. I have limited visibility into instruction set architectures. However, I know about GPIOs and stuff like that. So in case there's questions there, I can, I can only promise to try my best. I have torches. I'm gonna go downstairs. I'm gonna go downstairs to the vines and mindlessly mine again. Cause I collect it, what did I do? I cut down a couple of trees. I'm gonna get myself some sticks, but not yet. I'll craft torches when I need them. Otherwise, I'm just going to take up my inventory. I like to go on tangents. I was also talking about... What was... Oh, C CES. That was the point. I was talking about CES. There was some really, really cool stuff that I saw at CES, which stands for the Consumer Electronics Show, who the, for those who are not privy. I need to find my way to get downstairs. This freaking maze of a laboratory I have here. Goodness gracious. There we go. That's how I get downstairs. Back to the mines. Anyways, there was a lot of cool stuff there. Let me think about... So in terms of the stuff that I particularly work with, I'm a firmware developer, and I create drivers uh, for Bluetooth devices to be able to talk to an operating system that we make. And so it's very interesting to see how different Bluetooth devices are out there. A lot of them being medical grade, a lot of them not being medical grade. You've got things like, EC, like ECGs that are portable. You have blood pressure cuffs, a lot of it. And there were some really, really interesting devices that I saw out there that, I mean, they probably probably have stuff out there um that are i guess more interesting than what i saw but i did i did see a couple of them like a couple of very interesting technologies at least i have no idea what the f sad stands as subject is all about computer and architecture in this case all that they know is that they need to pass to get their data science degree ah that's pretty cool data science 
If I may ask, what kind of data science do you do? You're more like machine learning stuff? Because I would think if the computer architecture stuff is totally not your thing, and I understand that, then maybe you're more kind of like in the software world where you do like machine learning or like data structures and algorithms and stuff like that. To be honest, I guess the benefit of the computer architecture course is you're supposed to get, like, I think the intent is that you're supposed to get an idea of how the data structures that you utilize look like underneath the hood and how hardware constraints can kind of affect the optimization of your algorithms. But to be perfectly honest, in this day and age, in the world of like, like cloud computing and stuff like that, the hardware that you're working on really doesn't matter. It's about how much you're paying for the computing power, really. Or if your computer can run TensorFlow, basically. Yes, and AI. AI is really, really cool. I didn't partic I took a couple of courses in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning, a lot of them but kind of on the calculatory, like theoretical stuff of it all, um, like probability and stuff like that. It's very, very fascinating. And of course, I'm enthused about ChatGPT and MidJourney and um, what's the other one? Dolly 2, of course. Computer architecture is useless to us. Now, hypothetically speaking, I'll, ra I'll raise a little bit of a counterpoint there. If you wind up getting into a field, let's say a, the field of machine learning AI that you're in is on particular chips. Actually, one of the booths that I stopped by is a company called Nordic Semiconductor, and they make a bunch of, they make chips. The chips do a variety of different things. And one of their chips, I was surprised to see that they had a booth that or a little display that said this thing is running ai this thing is running machine learning it's like there's no way that this low power chip is running machine learning i gotta ask one of my contacts about this and he was like yeah so the idea is you use this other website to generate your machine learning model and then it converts it into firmware that you can actually program onto this unit which will operate as a syst as a black box that takes in inputs and outputs outputs and i was like hey that's pretty cool because one of the things that I worked on in college as my senior project was a thing that they, it wasn't specifically neuromorphic computing, but the idea was essentially you would create a machine learning model, just a very shallow network in this case, like no more than like four neurons at a time, um, that would be able to detect sleep apnea data with some level of accuracy while using a very small amount of power on an FPGA, a particular type of chip that means field programmable gate array. It's just a programmable chip. And so that was really fascinating, and there's semantics about why I didn't get as much out of that project as I wanted to, because the, the pandemic was happening and my university kind of sucked in a way. It didn't actually kind of suck. I went to Drexel. It was it was a nice place, but they were saying like, I was a hardware guy, so I really really like the whole computer architecture chip stuff. But they were like, yeah, don't do any hardware stuff. You won't get any extra credit for it. And I was like, well, fuck you too, I guess. Um, but we did it anyway. Uh, one of my one of my uh, lab mates, uh, one of my fraternity brothers, was um, had access to the FPGA lab, so we got we got what we wanted to work on, which was cool. It didn't work for shit. Like our model was terrible. It was too the res the, the the model had too low resolution for it to do any good, and we realized that, and we made a fifteen page report on it how shitty it was. But we tried, and damn, we tried. And I got my degrees, and I'm very happy about that. Um, <laughs> it was really really annoying. Um. But yeah, the computer architecture stuff, at least for me, especially, so when it comes down to, I guess, AI and machine learning, unless you're, let's say, let's say you're in a Tesla car and you're running a machine learning model, you may need to know about the computer architecture that's running beneath it to be able to, like, conserve on power. At that point, it becomes a question of optimization and how much energy you can spend. If you're working in an electric car, for instance, running machine learning models, you need to make sure that you optimize your algorithms and instruction, even create your own architecture to be able to do what you want to do quick and efficiently because you're working on a battery and if the battery runs out you're stranded in the middle of the desert right so that's why a lot of companies like google have their own google has their own like machine learning chip and i feel like most people are like well what the hell does that mean like what do you mean a machine learning chip if you think about it there are some circuits some like little black chips that are in your boards that are more optimized to do certain things than others some of them are adders they're really really good at adding numbers together they might overflow and give you negative numbers technically or really really big numbers that mean absolutely nothing but they're stupid and they do what they're supposed to do and they do it pretty well with a bunch of gates and whatnot on the inside which i'm not going to go into the semantics of but it is very fascinating if you're if you're willing to look that up on your own time computer's freezing a little bit just wait for it to go there you go but for instance you might want something that uses little very little power well oftentimes programmable chips Chips that, chips that, whatever architecture runs underneath, you don't need to worry about at all. You don't care what it's running. You code in C, you code in Java, you code in Rust, whatever. You program it to the chip and you're done. You want nothing else to do with it. You don't even care. You let the compiler and the assembler do all the work for you. But if you have something that's as power hungry as AI models, 
you might want a chip that is specifically really, really good at training data. Let's say taking an input and training a model with it. Certain operations like, um, I don't know, let's say you have like a stable diffusion chip. I, I, I'm a little fuzzy on the specific like machine learning operations like, like um, I guess, gradient descent, spectral analysis, stuff like that. I'm just throwing out buzzwords. I don't necessarily remember what they all mean. But you might, if you have like a machine learning system that you're working on, you might not want just an Arduino doing all that work for you. It's going to cost you a lot of money in the end. It might wind up getting way too hot and frying itself. It might be too, it might be like uh, too slow for, let's say, a self-driving car but again you might be at the level where you don't really care about that stuff you're you're like i just want i want to do big data in which case you know the chip stuff is definitely below you are you supposed to create that chip no no if you're doing like big ai and stuff like that you're definitely not the one who's supposed to create the chip i actually went through a bit of a crossroads in my degree where i was really really interested in um i, I was really interested in circuit design I liked putting resistors together and capacitors and stuff. I liked making my own little motor spin with an Arduino attached to it, and that really enthused me for a little while. Then I started taking classes that were about, okay, well, attaching individual resistors together, not really going to get you anywhere. Instead, you should be able to know how to fabricate these resistors and complex logic gate structures using individual, like, groups of molecules and atoms with power buses and sectors on chips and memory, and I was like, this is wacky. And that was during my computer architecture courses, mind you that. And I was like, I am not, I don't want to do very large scale integrated circuits. I don't want to do VLSIs. I don't want to do make the ASICs, the application specific integrated circuits. I don't do any of that stuff. Yo, what's up, Bryce? How do you feel about the chips that are really good at tasting like Cool Ranch? Honestly, if those chips are running an instruction set architecture, probably a reduced one, I'd be surprised. But if I can machine learn using only a bag of Doritos alone, we're living in the next century, baby. Um, I don't think I'll see that in my time. Them chips are the are chips that Dom usually eats at work. I try to stay away from chips for the most part. Too much in salt, but damn, could I crush a whole bag of Doritos if I wanted to? And then I went to the store the other day and we got Cape Cod chips. Good stuff. Good chips. Got a nice texture to them. Where was I going with that? I don't know where I was going with that exploration. Machine learning, machine learning, machine learning. Boner time! MK Bryce has a boner because of the content that we create here, and he copped in with a Prime sub for three months. We do a lot of things for stuff like that, but I've got a crown, so... Here's the Bryce's boner. Another hat upon my head. I'm the freaking king today, baby! To be perfectly honest, I feel on top of the world after that conference, and this is just... I, I appreciate it. It's giving me fuel to move on. It feels really good. I had an excellent... So... I had an excellent dinner. Uh, my fiance started her next clinical session. Um, it'll be the next three months, and then another three months after that. So I'm in charge of dinner now. So, oh, hello, Chupacabra. Ah, alas, Chupacabra. Hey there. Hey there, bud. Do you eat chips? What's your favorite flavor of chip? Are you a Cool Ranch kind of guy? Are you, like, nacho cheese? Are you the, the Fury nacho cheese, or whatever they call that flavor? All right. Perhaps you're a Takis kind of guy. Chupacabra. Taki. Feels very... Feels within the same range. What was I doing down here? Ah, yes. Playing Minecraft. That was the whole point of it all. Instruction set architectures. Machine learning. Where was I going with that? Can Dom say that quiches are extremely easy to make and are very filling? Dude. Egg in a pan. Maybe put some crust on it. Maybe not. Quiches are very easy. You put oh, garlic in there, onions in there, like vegetables and stuff. Gotta eat your veg. Gotta eat your veggies, man. And a quiche is an excellent way of getting that veggie fill. It absolutely is. Quiches are great. Quiches don't have integrated circuits within them, though. And that's... I think that's unfortunate. Oh, speaking of cooking and stuff. At CES, I saw a bunch of smart devices all talking to each other. There was this one room that I went into that was all supposedly running on this new standard that's hitting the scene called Matter. Think of it kind of like Zigbee, if you're familiar with it. Think of it... Oh, hello, you. Gasshole. Think of it like... Uh, let me put it to you this way. Bluetooth allows for your device to talk to a particular other device. Um, but just because your device can talk to an Amazon device does not mean that it can talk to a Google device. It'd be really, really cool if all of your devices could talk to all of your hubs, no matter what kind of hub it is, whether it be one of our hubs, whether it be a Google hub, whether it be an Amazon hub, whether it be an Ikea hub, whether it be a Samsung hub, whatever. So the Connected Standards Alliance worked together to create 
a to come together and create a standard called Matter, which just hit the scene and is coming out there for like smart bulbs and stuff like that. And it came from a project called the Connected Home over IP project, aka Chip, which evolved from the Zigbee Alliance. A little bit of history there. Very fascinating stuff. But so the idea is any of your smart lights, they shouldn't just be Alexa compatible. They shouldn't just be Google compatible. They should just be Matter compatible. And so long as it's running matter, it doesn't matter what tech giant that you swear your loyalty to, it should work with all of them. Basically like a universal docking port for information to communicate. Imagine the USB port for you, Will, as the hardware analog to matter, except hardware is USB and through software over the air protocols, matter is supposed to be that interconnected standard. Doesn't matter what you got, so long as you've got a matter compatible server and a matter compatible node might be the term it doesn't matter got him bryce it should just work i think that the marketing terms that they're using that just like ah the building blocks of everything and i was like yeah but like it doesn't seem as casual i like the whole like <laughs> matter <laughs> why what's the matter with you <laughs> anyways um it really hasn't taken much form yet and it really is only in its like i first think first iteration of development but our company recently joined the Connected Standards Alliance, uh, and we're trying to work on the, essentially, how this matter protocol is supposed to work with medical devices. Because a lot of the distrust for medical devices comes from the fact that it's health data. You don't necessarily want Google to have access to know how fat you are or how thin you are. They don't necessarily want to, you don't necessarily want them to know that you're diabetic or that you're basically dying and you suffer from, like, a disease that or like a particular disease that means you don't have a proper blood pressure. Like you don't necessarily want Google to know that you have that kind of data. Right now, the solution is that if you go to the store and you buy a new glucometer, which measures your blood sugar, it's probably gonna have some sort of brand. That brand is gonna have their own app. That brand is gonna have its own privacy policy in terms of use and what they do with your data and when, and hopefully they show it to you and maybe they provide trend analysis and whatnot to you so you can track your blood sugar and you know not deal with the multitude of other pe issues that people have to deal with if they have like diabetes for example accessibility to insulin because that shit is kind of fucked up hello just like you kind of come up on my backside also kind of fucked up get out of here um but so if you have a bunch of different devices you're all trying to measure all of your different you know data points at once you're going to have all these different apps. It's really, really confusing. And technically, this is a pitch for our product, which works for with all of those devices and a growing list more and more every day. But the point beyond that is that you shouldn't have to worry about stuff like that. You, as a person who might be like like geriatric and have arthritis and can't move around and are basically in your hospital bed for the rest of your, your mortal existence, you really shouldn't have to worry about like app annoyances. You shouldn't have to worry about making sure that, oh, does your insurance cover the Google Nest, which is able to talk with your blood pressure cuff, which I don't think it does right now. But you should not have to worry about that stuff. You should just know, hypothetically speaking, that you just bought a new light because it's too damn dark at your hospital bed. And you know you have an Alexa uh, Echo Dot that somebody bought for you. You should just be able to plug it in, set it up, make sure that it works. And there's countless other scenarios of why this would be useful, but this is the one that's kind of got, I guess, the most emotional backing to it. Um, I know people, p people in my family who are kind of old and kind of crusty, a little fragile, a bit of senile, who don't want to deal with all this stuff. It's annoying. And to be perfectly honest, if you have somebody in your family like that and you've got a person that might be, it probably bothers the hell out of you. You're like, I can't blame the person for being senile. They're old. I get it. I understand that. Eventually, I'll be old and senile too. But what bothers, grinds my gears, is that these these people out there who create their apps, they create their hardware devices, they don't have enough forethought to think that people are probably going to get really pissed off about this. We should make the user interface, the, the interoperability, easy. And I guess you can become very, very annoyed at that, which for a while I was very, very annoyed about that. But honestly, at that point, you might want to say, oh, we got to blame the programmers. But like, you really, sometimes you can't blame the programmers there either. If it's a hard, piece of hardware, Hardware is hard. No pun intended. I mean it that way. This Bluetooth stuff and whatnot, all these other protocol standards and making your own one, it's difficult to do. It's a lot of work. And you need a really, really smart person on your team if you want to make that happen. And to be honest, instead, we should have some a group of really, really smart people who know what the hell they're talking about make a standard that doesn't matter 
what the underlying interface is, it should just work. Because people don't want to put up with that shit anymore. And to be perfectly honest, and again, there have been standards like this that have popped up a couple times over the last couple of years. Zigbee was one of them. Z-Wave is one of them. Open Thread and whatnot are those ones for mesh networks. And people want this stuff to happen. They've been talking about it for a while. I have literally no idea if Matter is going to be the one that fixes everything. But you know what? It's the closest that we've ever gotten. Companies like Amazon and Google, maybe? I just know Amazon's the one I know for sure. The other ones might actually as well. Are now saying that they're offering like Matter support and their, their Google Home Minis and their Amazon Echo Dots and their Exo sh Echo Shows and stuff like that. They're like, if you've got a Matter compatible device, excuse me, it'll work with our hardware no matter what. And I'm very happy about that, actually. You know, I'm burping a lot because the dinner I had was so amazing. I apologize for that. But I had, I got a Google Nest Hub the other day um, for work, for evaluation purposes. It's actually really cool. It tells me the time sometimes. This is it. It's telling me the time. It is 9.10 right now. And I brought it home for evaluation. And because I can tell it to tell my life, I can tell it to tell me the time and what the weather is outside. Where was I going with that? Oh, and it was kind of cool. I have a new Google Pixel phone, too. It's a Google Pixel 7 Pro, and I love the hell out of it. It's very, very powerful. It's got that machine learning chip on the inside, which some really, really smart person out there who did the, the, the crux between machine learning and computer architecture was probably behind that chip. It wasn't just Google in general. There was definitely at least a lead engineer who paved the way for this, and that's something that should be celebrated. They were like, um, what were they like? What was I just thinking of? Anyway, oh, so I got the phone, and the phone actually popped up with a little screen, and the screen said, we just detected a new Matter device on your network. Would you like to set that up? And I was like, I didn't tell you I bought a new Google Host Home Hat Test Mini. My, my boss did, but I didn't tell you I did that. But because we were on the same, because we were just in the same area, my phone popped up with this little Matter, lo matter logo and was like, you want to set up your Matter device? And I was like, yeah, well, not right now. I'll do it later. Because I was like, I didn't realize that Matter was already compatible with these phones. This was like a month ago. This was like very shortly after May they made the announcement. No headphone jack. LOL, nerd. It's weird because the, the phone case I have, I don't know if you can see that. It has a little hole. The phone case has a hole for a headphone jack, but it's a microphone. And the Google Pixel is better than all phones. And because of my own internal biases, and I recognize that those biases are there, I would agree with you, Sag. I would, because I love these phones. I've been using Google Pixel's phones for like, you know, like s seven years now. I think I've had my Pixel phone. I started with a Pixel 2 through, I think all through college and stuff. Nah, that stuff is. I'm telling you. That stuff's good. I love the Google Pixel phone. And there's a piece of me, I guess there's probably a piece of me that should be worried about all the data that Google is collecting on me and whatnot. But I actually, I had a really, really wonderful conversation with somebody at the conference. Um, somebody who talks with one of my coworkers a lot and kind of inspires him, I believe, because he mentions him a lot in conversation. Really awesome guy. And I was talking to him about just this. The idea that there's a lot of data out there. It just exists in the world. Companies, or let's abstract it below companies, sensors in general are collecting data about you and what surrounds you literally all the time. There is nothing that you can do about the data that is being collected on you. Of the stuff that does not knowingly be connected. You can do stuff about the data that you know is being collected on you, and I think the world is kind of wising up to that stuff, but there will always be data that somebody's collecting on you that you don't know about. There's probably somebody out there, maybe not today, that will someday look at all the itty bitty details of the stuff that appears in this video box over here, and the games that I play, and the inflection in my voice to figure out exactly where I am and where I'm going, build a digital twin of me and figure out how to play Minecraft in my place so that zombies don't attack me from behind or so that big companies can sneak up on me from behind. It's definitely happening, and there's nothing I can do to stop about that. However, I find that from the perspective of, if you, if you come from my perspective and you say that the data is going to be collected on me anyway, instead, I would like to have as much... I wouldn't say the word control. I don't necessarily want to control how you're using the data, but I want to know about that data. I guess the context of the data. I don't want to know where it is. I want to know what it is about it. I think Google does a relatively good job, it can always be better, about telling you what data they have on you. They also tell you how they're using it. I don't know how much I trust Google as a whole, but there's at least a statement that says what data they're collecting on you and how they supposedly use it. I'm a bit of a skeptic, so I'm not going to believe that all the time. 
but there's a bunch of interfaces and whatnot that I can go to to see like my location data and my browsing data and all this other data, my ads data and blah, 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 the other stuff. And I like the fact that it's there. So, so much to the point where, I mean, I don't have full reliance on Google, but a lot of my, a lot of my, uh, like security stuff is embedded within Google. Like you use it like single sign on and stuff like that. That's a really, really cool thing. And hypothetically speaking, somebody could target that. And this is, this is indicative, this doesn't happen to anybody. Somebody could target that and harvest everything. But I guess I have enough trust that like, they're not going to do that. But like, you know, LastPass, another company that does like secure passwords and stuff got hacked like 40 times the other day. Um, so I really wouldn't recommend putting full faith in any company and you know I, I am a skeptic so i would say don't put that trust into anybody why did i put wood there cameron what are you doing i wouldn't put that trust into anybody but you know we're social human creatures and uh if we don't trust anybody um life life just won't be as fun as it could be um what am i doing <laughs> no wood no wood stone there we go quick maths dash line dash lane dash lane what's dash lane Dash lane is greater? Ooh. I don't know what dash lane is. I'm not familiar with what dash lane is. Dash lane. Dash lane versus one password versus last pass. Hey, look at that. Programmed in TypeScript, Kotlin, and Swift. Available in 12 different languages and initially released in May 20. May 23rd, 2012. Dashlane is a subscription-based password manager and digital wallet application available on Mac OS, Windows, iOS, and Android. Dashlane uses a freemium pricing model with a subscription plan options. So it's free up to a limit. It's kind of cool. Never heard of Dashlane before. I I like when I first when I um when I first got into this next chapter of my life, I started using LastPass for like a couple of things because it seemed to be very prevalent in the stuff that I was doing. I never fully relied on it because I just didn't want to. I already had a password management service. It's one of the, it's up in my brain and it feels very good and it's very intuitive because I formed it in my brain. Um, and then like a year or so after using it, they came out with the security stuff. And of course, confirmation bias is a bitch because I was like, ooh, ooh, I told myself I wasn't going to trust you. And now I definitely shouldn't trust you because you had a security breach. But like that, that is such a, it's, it's a very limited point of view. Eventually. Whatever I'm using now, if it's not within my brain, maybe even my brain one day is going to be hacked. Somebody is going to figure out a way to hack it and get all my passwords. Um, at that point, hopefully you got multi-factor authentication set up um, and that people don't have access to your phone, which you may or may not have set up your multi-factor authentication on. And hopefully you password protected your phone and the security layers just keep going. And if you're a little neurotic, I don't know if that's the right word to use, but I'm a little paranoid. I, I, don't, I also don't know if that's the right word to use. You may go down that line and see how far it goes for the sake of your security, or you may not. You may be the person who is old, senile, and don't care about that stuff, and you're just like, why can't Dashline just store all my passwords for me? And well, to you, Gramps, Cameron of the future, I got good news for you. You could have it now for the freemium pricing model that was established in 2012, May 23rd or whatever it was. It could all be yours. Now for the low, low price of whatever they're charging you. And don't forget to use my promo code Cameron with the X for 20% off your first purchase. If you can figure out how to spell it on your own and it works, good for you. This is not a sponsor deal, but if it works, hopefully we can all get a benefit out of that. If it works, let me know. <laughs> I'd be interested. In Sage's case, it does everything that they need and all for free, which is great. Honestly, I'm a big proponent of use, um, I guess the term is milking it. I don't know if that's a proper term, but I like, I like the idea of milking something that I'm using for everything that it's got. If you got a cow and you want to take things literally, milk that sucker till it, till it just can't lactate no more. It sounds a little weird, so instead, I like to use a less real analogy. For example, um, my university offered space for classes, and although I was a little wild for doing it, I decided to basically take, what was it, like, anywhere between 17 to 20 credits, which is like the maximum, every single term, and I came out with three degrees. Something I wouldn't recommend people doing unless you really feel that you can do it. I, for one, am a very vain person. I'm a very... Um, I think I'm a very stubborn person. And like, there's another word that I'm just blanking on right now. But I was like, if this university is going to take a bunch of money from me, I'm going to milk as much as I can from it. I'm going to get as much as I can out of the five years that I was there so that I don't look back on it and regret it or feel like, ah, I could have milked that cow more. Dom's cousin has two cows, actually. 
I hope that your cousin treats those cows more than theoretically I would with my current philosophy. Uh, but anyway, in terms of my university and my education, ugh, I milked that sucker. Not only the university, I milked myself pretty hard. Metaphorically speaking, um, I do not lactate. I, I am male. Um, I don't believe I lactate, except under very special circumstances or with the inclination of certain diseases. I don't know. I'm not a medical professional. If you're biologically male and you didn't do anything to your body, taking stuff like that, and you start lactating, maybe talk to your doctor? I don't know. That or tell me about it. I'm very curious. I'm not a licensed physician. I couldn't tell you to do anything about it. I guess... Grab a cup. See what it tastes like. I'm a mixology. I'm a mixologist. I taste shit. Even though I might not need to. I saw a bunch of TikTok videos come out about how you can make like a Sprite tasting thing by putting like... I think it was... Not pine needles. Maybe it was pine needles into like sparkling water. And I was like... Oh, hey... I'm I'm experiencing Christmas right now, and we've got a we've got a spruce tree here with with needles all over it. I'm gonna take one of those and put them in my mouth, and I think it was pretty good. I was out hiking with my brothers uh, a few months ago up in the beautiful beautiful state of Vermont in the mountains up there, and um, I took some things that looked like they were growing off of a tree. They looked like buds. It looked like they might have become sticks or flowers. And I put it in my mouth, and I started eating it. And it tasted a little nutty, because somewhere, somehow, I would not recommend doing this, by the way, and I will explain why in a second. Because I saw a video on the internet saying that if you found stuff that looked like this from a tree that looked like this, then it probably tasted a little nutty. And I took it off, and I put it in my mouth. Lucky for me, I wasn't, I wasn't hurt by that, because I wouldn't recommend to anybody to go out into the wild and pick things off the ground and put them into your mouth unless you know what you're doing. And I will openly admit, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I saw a video of it on the internet, which is never a good enough reason to go out and try it for yourself. If I saw somebody making something out of wood using a jigsaw and a, and a power saw, and, a, and like a power cutter or something, and I saw that on the internet, I am confident to go off and do that myself because I have utilized these, this equipment for like the past 15 years of my life. And although, I, let's say I'm not licensed, I have enough of a head on my shoulders and experience with the appliances that are mentioned that I have relative confidence that I'm not going to hurt myself or others. Again, I could very well cut my finger off one day because of that that seemingly confident statement. And well, I guess I'll learn that lesson when I get to it. And one day I will, potentially. Um, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, y'all. I need, I'm really, I'm getting like very dry of the lips, so I'm going to go up here for a second. I'm going to fill my water back there, apply a little bit of lip stuff hydrate hy hydrate or dihydrate i have a big stein of water and it's running low so i'm gonna go pull that up. I i'm not going very far i'm just back here hi everybody it's me and i'm back here i'm at my bar i mix cocktails on wednesdays those of you who are new i'm familiar I like cocktails I like stuff i was thinking about making a cocktail for this stream here um i just didn't i figured i'd do water instead I was a little pressed for, time, pressed for time before the stream started. So I was like, maybe I don't have enough time to make a cocktail. Although, the cocktail that I wanted to make is super easy. I wanted to make a Negroni. They're very yummy. Equal parts gin, Campari, and sweet vermouth. Good stuff. It's a spirit-forward drink, but it's also a classic. Very easy to make. And I make it very often because it's one of the, it's one of the things that I got. Yo, so my pal Sajstan just walked into this bar. <laughs> and lo and behold, he's talking about... You need to go revise some computer architecture, so don't fail. Didn't expect to stay here. Fun to chat. Absolutely. Come back anytime. I love talking technical stuff if you're into that kind of stuff. We can also talk about machine learning another time, because that stuff is also peaking up my interest. Go for it, says Dom. I'm down for it. Go for what? Making a cocktail? Making a, making a Negroni? We can make a Negroni. They're fun and easy to make. Just like shorts. They're fun and easy to wear. I wouldn't want to wear my Negroni. Also, I'm currently down in the mines. When I, when I go back up... Uh, because I ran out of torches or food or something, remind me that it's cocktail time. I'm gonna make a quick, quick talk, cocktail because we can. Because my entire bar is behind me. If I didn't mention already, Sag, good luck on that exam. Um, computer architecture is a bitch, so. I understand. I'll be drinking tomorrow, says Dom. Yo, I'll be drinking on Wednesday. What a coincidence. Not. I like to drink on Wednesdays. Wednesdays are my... <laughs> it's funny to think that, like, I have a particular day of choice that I choose to drink. I've gone, I've gone, you know, I, I actively talk with my doctor and stuff, and I go for my physical every year, and I get my checkups and stuff, and they ask me, they're like, so on average, oh, and I even started taking therapy lessons, to, uh, lessons, 
therapy sessions too, and they ask like, well, how much do you drink? And I was like, well, I drink anywhere between two to three times a week. And they're like, okay, well, how much? Do okay, so the question is, how often do you drink? It's like anywhere between two to three times a week, usually only once. And I'm like, okay, well, how many drinks do you have in their setting? Well, like technically speaking, I will make anywhere between three to five drinks at a time, but I don't drink all of them. I take a few sips. I maybe enjoy one or two of them. And that's it. And I wind up saving the rest and distributing them throughout the week, or I just wind up throwing them out because I don't have enough fridge space for all that stuff. I do have a big freezer now, so I could probably freeze them if I wanted to. And that's an idea. I've never really tried freezing my cocktails. Um, that's an idea. That might be something preservation-wise I might actually try try doing. Um, oh, I completely forgot to do for that follow that just dropped. I'm trying to get ideas of what we do for follows around here. Um, so I'm changing it up. Um, Anna got a set of tuning forks. For her uh, for Christmas, um, this tuning fork is 741 hertz. I don't know whether it is going to hurt. I've never actually done this into the microphone before. So in case you are sensitive to high pitched or long long pitched noises that are of a particular frequency, cover your ears. If not, please experience the tuning fork magic with me with my favorite color blue. 741 hertz, soul. Thank you, Sag. Ba If I put it far enough away from the microphone and just to keep doing it back and forth, maybe good stuff will happen. <laughs> I don't know. Can anybody hear that? Did that sound okay? Was that ungodly unpleasant? Because like I put these things up to my ear and they can be very disturbing. They can be. These things are very loud when you put them up to your ear. They're, they're tuning forks. If you're not familiar with tuning forks already, <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, they were they were a gift to Anna from her mother, who uh, is of the belief that potentially particular sounds acoustically can heal you in a certain way, either either of the body or other of the mind or even of the mind of the body. Um, I don't necessarily even know if I believe in that stuff, but you know what? It could very well be a, a thing that's as yet unexplored, and it might help me out. Personally, I like lo-fi music, and lo-fi music is characterized by some pedal tones and stuff like that, so. Maybe it'll help me. And I actually do find it kind of therapeutic. And you know what? Whatever it is that you do, so long as it's not hurting somebody else, and it makes you feel good, ride that wave. We're all just trying to feel good. Dom's heard worse, to be honest. Oh, I've certainly heard worse. Um, silverware scratching against each other, people grinding their teeth, or people grinding silverware against their teeth. Yeah. Fucking hate that. Not not a good feeling. Do not like. Not liking at all. I'm apparently... F am I full on cobblestone? Have I filled up on the cobble? No, I've still got more cobble space. I've still got more space in my miners' backpacks. This is fine. This is fine. This is fine. Let's go this way. I haven't gone this way yet. Let's see. What else did I see at CES? CES was really, really cool. I think, uh, I, again, I was saying one of the highlights of it was like, I really felt like, it, it almost felt like anybody I walked up to, not necessarily anybody, I could have like a really, really good conversation about what, let's say, they were working on or what we were around. Even if I wasn't like, let's say, particularly in an area where we were talking about, like, let's say I hung around the digital health area for a while because that's what my company does and I was manning the booth there and giving pitches and doing demos and stuff. So... Just because you walked up to the stand doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to have like a really, really in-depth conversation about, you know, digital health and healthcare and stuff like that. But like every once in a while, like somebody from like Amazon would come by or or like Microsoft and I'd, I'd ask like, are you like a hardware person? I could really vibe with them on the hardware we were working on. It was really, really cool when I started giving like the general pitch about what we do as a company and somebody winds up asking like, you know, like, hey, what chip are you running under there? And I was like, oh, we're running under some of the Nordic chips and like, oh, well, I'm familiar with some of them. I was like, yeah, yeah, it could do some really, really cool stuff. Let's talk about it. Um, it was really cool because the company who manufactures the chips that we use in our device, the Nordic Semiconductor, actually had a booth of their own. It was actually really cool. I've met one, I, I met a couple folks from the company. They delivered some stuff to us in person over at our Philadelphia office. It was really cool. And I just had like a very cursory, like, uh, you know, like, hey, nice to meet you. Thanks for dropping this off. Hope to see you again sometime. I know we'll be at the same conference in a little bit. Um, and so I actually saw him. I had to, I had a whole, oh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is my flight debacle. Oh my God, it was annoying. Anyway, I had to reschedule a flight. I had to book a new flight. And on that new flight, I actually saw this individual uh, waiting to get on the flight, and I passed by him as he was sitting in his chair, and I was like, yo, I, I recognize you. You've been out of our office. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, evidently, we're both going to the conference, so we'll see you there. And it did stop by um, his booth over at Nordic, and we, we vibed for a while. It was really, really cool. Apparently, he did his master's in, I think it was machine learning or AI or something like that, and I got to chat with him about the chip, because that's where I saw the chip that did the machine learning stuff, and I was like, wow, this is really cool. 
And I wish I could have talked to Xerof about it because that stuff is really, really interesting to me. And I want to know more about like how these algorithms and stuff work. It's, it's, it's wild. <clears throat> Excuse me. But that was cool. I like that. Um, what else was there? Oh, the booth, the the booth of the guys who actually manufacture the the box that we that the, the box that we distribute was really really cool. Uh, the box that I program and I'm very very familiar with now. Um, the the booth is called the the company is called Fanstel. It's very cool. Totally no relation. There is a relation. Um, but I got to talk to the people that were there. That was really really cool. I got to meet the people who I kind of talk back and forth with every once in a while for questions about the hardware or logistics and getting some more shipped over and stuff like that. And it was really cool to meet in person. I didn't meet the top dog, um, but I did meet the person that was in charge of logistics and I believe marketing and stuff. And that was really really cool. I actually, I was so I was like getting all like I was like squealing like a little girl over there. Uh, not the not the put down little girls like there's there's a certain excitement that they have towards things for at least um stereotypically speaking and i had that sort of stereotypical excitement when i saw this hardware booth and i was like oh my god like i programmed the i programmed the box that you've given us i love the way that it works i like the company that you that i wound up working for that uses those devices and stuff i'm getting really hot so i'm gonna unbutton one of my things and take off my socks and I was like, yo, this is super cool. Like, I was so happy to have a conversation with you. And I was talking about all the different modules that they had, which they had on display. And I was asking about other hardware options and asking about the capabilities of the cell chips that they have and modules and whatever. And I was like, oh my God, it was so... <laughs> I was so hyped about it. It was so cool. Like, I didn't think I could get so excited. Like, like I originally went into electrical engineering because computers, computers got me. I was really, really amused with computers. I loved computers. And I was like, I want to make computers. That feels like hardware. And then I did some computer engineering stuff, which s scratched my itches a lot more than I thought it would. Oh, God. Hi there. Hey, bud. <laughs> Alrighty then. Um, oh, hey. I see you. Come over here, buddy. Let me tell you about the hard-on I get for hardware. Oh, okay. No. Yet another person who walks away at the thought of computer architecture. Tisk tisk tisk. Nah, just kidding. Everybody's got their stick. Everybody's got their stick. And apparently that creeper wasn't in hardware. Neither was this one. The zombie? Not in hardware. I'm a hardware dude. Actually, well, I guess like yeah. Um, it's no wonder that I got so giddy about the hardware stuff, like, cause that's that's kind of where I started. And I still, I still, I still love to be able to get my hands on a new chip. I want love being able to know about the capabilities of what those chips and what protocols it implements and what you could do with them and what kind of like cool gadget that you make you can make for yourself at home. I think the thing that really got me going about hardware and computers and stuff was because the idea that you could program them to do whatever you wanted to. I didn't like VLSI and ASICs and stuff because once you made them do what they needed to do, you never got to change them. For the most part fpgas were kind of cool because they're field programmable gate arrays you can reprogram them but like actually creating these things in the architecture and stuff i wasn't super into that i wanted to get my hands on the chips so i could play around with them and really juice what i can out of their capabilities whether that be their machine learning stuff or like these these interrupt timers or the fact that they can they've got a two gigahertz clock that's running underneath there i was like oh that's pretty cool or otherwise um how much data that i can like transmit how much data you can process what kind of operations you can do on that data without setting the thing on fire that stuff was really cool to me i love the idea of optimizing the code for the hardware i liked coding coding was cool really really scratched that itch i took a coding class in high school was ap comp sci and i liked it i took the in i took the programming courses throughout college and i really enjoyed them too some of them not so much but i struggled through that um that basic ugh, it was like a basic basic computer science course and it taught me how to write bash scripts and although i hated that class i can write bash scripts now they're really cool it's nice to be able to program things on the command line in linux or even on windows or the linux subsystem on windows or other operating systems and stuff it's kind of cool to be able to do that um whew, i'm gonna take a I'm take a quick break from speaking for a second i think i need a little bit of time for my vocal cords to reset <clears throat> excuse me All right, back to running my mouth for the next hour and a half. Oh my god, I've been streaming for an hour and a half already. Wow. That's a really cool part about getting really, really into something. I feel like I could talk about it for 
hours and hours and hours. Um, I know that because of um, Anna's new uh, stuff, Anna's clinical now that she's going on, that she's going to sleep a little earlier, so I'm going to try to be a little quieter. I actually got this cool mic arm over the Christmas break, and um, that's the thing. I don't have to feel like I need to be so loud. I can just talk at a normal volume. I don't need to scream. I don't need to feel like I need to scream anymore. This could become an ASMR stream for all I know. Nobody knows. The world is in the palm of our hands. Talk lower, Cameron. I don't know. Can we? Are we still picking that up? We are indeed picking that up. This is good. This is good. It's not like I've had like. It's not like anybody's banging on the floor yet. So I think, I think we'll be all right for a little bit. But I just want to try to be conscious of that. Started making dinner more too because we have a, a time like the timing just like back and forth Anna gets home really really late sometimes it's right up against the stream time and we want to make sure that everybody gets fed and that everybody's happy have i ever played cyberpunk says dom <laughs> i have played cyberpunk i didn't get very far into it actually the reason why i built the computer that i'm playing games on and streaming on right now was because i wanted to play cyberpunk it didn't work on the laptop that i used to use for that stuff so i got some i built myself some new hardware to run cyberpunk i haven't played too much of it um, this is really powerful, and I want to, like, when I play a game like that for the first time, I want to make sure that when I play it, I'm in the right mindset to completely absorb all there is about it. I want to make sure that, like, I give respect enough to me as the person who wants to play it and experience it, um, to be able to, like, really enjoy what's going on. Because, like, the first time, like, another cyberpunk game that I've played called Valhalla, it's a mixology game, it's a, a visual novel game, very, very fun. I went through, like, really, really fast the first time, I, like, I, I enjoyed it. But like the first time I went through it, I was like, ah, I missed a lot of it. And I didn't wind up getting through the whole thing, and I felt like I missed something. I took a very, very slow amount of time to go through it the next time. And it was very, very enjoyable. One of the one of my favorite games of all time. It's also cyberpunk themed. And then I wound up streaming it too. It was one of the first games that I wound up streaming on Twitch. Uh, and it was also very enjoyable there too. I definitely rushed through it because that was the first time I ever played it like drinking along with it. So I got a little tipsy during some episodes. And I definitely want to go back and play that again someday because like... I love that game so much. Um, but yes, I've played Cyberpunk. I've also read a couple of books that are of the Cyberpunk genre. I've played, I've read Neuromancer. I read um, Mona Lisa Overdrive. And I'm trying to get through, or maybe, ooh, what was the one in between? There was Neuromancer, Mona Lisa Overdrive, and another one. I don't remember if Mona Lisa Overdrive, maybe that's the one that I'm on there. I think I'm on Mona Lisa Overdrive right now. It's a trilogy by William Gibson. And I think that's like the book series that really set in stone cyberpunk as a genre. Oh, have I been here before? Hello? Oh, hey. What's going on? Cool. Uh, I will continue in a different direction. Where do, where do I want to go? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just playing Minecraft because I need an excuse to talk. I like to be able to let my mind go in one direction and my hands and fingers go in the other direction. I like for a while... <clears throat> excuse me like i thought like oh maybe i do like just chatting streams and stuff like that but like a just chatting stream doing nothing but chatting isn't very riveting to me it just like it doesn't scratch that itch it doesn't just doesn't i get like really distracted and stuff i want to be able to like really really focus on like i guess if i had like if i was really focusing on like a conversation and whatnot and really wanted to put my whole everything into it then i'd probably do that i mean anna and i um did like a discussion about the D23 Expo, I think, about a month or so ago, and it was just chatting one because, like, she and I were just kind of chatting back. It was mostly her educating me on stuff. We just chatted back and forth, and that was kind of cool because I had another person to do that with. But if it was just me, I don't know. I feel like it wouldn't be as fun. So instead, what I can do is my eyes will focus over here, dark between chat and stuff. If there's anything to talk about, if cool. If not, then we'll just go on and vibe with whatever we have. Because my, I feel like there's almost like. This is getting a little... Philo Every single time I play Minecraft, I get philo philosophical. And I, I love that about this game. It's my comfort game. That... It's almost like there's two, two processes running in my head. And one is one level of focus. And one is another level of focus. For instance, when I'm listening to music while I work... I can program and listen to music at the same time. And I'm less distracted. I can be more focused on the music. I'm sorry. I can be more focused on the task at hand... Okay, I guess I'm sleeping now. Um, because there's like a almost a noisy level of my focus that is focused on the music. 
So like sometimes like I'm always thinking like I feel like I'm always thinking about stuff. My mind never really feels like it's slowing. It's not thinking about something. Sometimes when I'm distracted doing other tasks, whether I'm doing dishes, I'm listening to somebody talk, or I have like a music going, like, there's almost like there's that piece of my mentality, that piece that's always going, that can focus on that, and I can put it off to the side. I call it the noise, like the my, my noisy train of thought. It's a very rickety road, doesn't really know what track it's supposed to be on all the time, but it is a train, and it is always rolling. And then there's this other side of my mentality, this other part of my psyche, that like, I can focus, I can pick which track it's going on, and I can keep that thing going for a while. Because I know what my direction is, and I don't have anything, I don't have all these other like, stuff going on to distract me. Whether that be ricketing in the analogical uh, train track, or otherwise, um, I'm not really sure. But so I feel like as I'm playing the game, as I'm playing this game right here, I feel like my, bo my body knows how to play the game. Like, the noisy part of my brain knows how to play Minecraft, and it can it can shut itself up while playing Minecraft. But then the other part of my brain, like the analytical part, the part that can focus on topics and tasks, specific tasks and, like, almost deep thinking and stuff, can focus while the other part of my brain is occupied doing other things. It's playing Minecraft. It's mining. It sounds very, um, I believe the term is dissociative. It's almost like there's a part of me that is separate than the part of the other and that could be indicative of a problem or some sort of like mental thing going on but it's never really detracted from anything i have high highs sometimes and low lows i talk with a therapist about that i'm very open about that um and so i think that kind of contribute i think whatever is going on in my head will wind up contributing to that stuff but i don't i think there are some times where it's very very helpful and i think it's kind of just something that i've come to terms with in my life and i'm very happy about it and i want to be able to utilize it as a tool dom asks if i've ever had a male adaptive daydream no, what is that? I want to Google that. What is that? Male adaptive daydream. Are you going to hurt me? You haven't taken notice of me yet. Let's see what the internet... Just a very cursory level. Ne never take things of Wikipedia at, like, full truth value, but in terms of, um... Male uh, adaptive daydream. In terms of a good, like, summary, Wikipedia does the job. Male adaptive daydreaming by sattva.com. What is it and how do you treat it? treat it symptoms and diagnosis by the sleep foundation.org uh, they say orgs are better this one says it's fact checked according to the website we'll see evidently male adaptive daydreaming sometimes known as daydreaming disorder male adaptive daydreaming describes better sleep in two weeks no thank you advertisement where a person regularly experiences daydreams that are intense and highly distracting so distracting in fact that the person may stop engaging with the task or people in front of them these daydreams may be triggered by real life events or stimuli such as a noise smell conversation topic or movie interesting i'm trying to think so like the, the what what that kind of feels like to me in terms of my interpretation of that summary that I just read, is almost like you get so attached to a thought while, like, over the course of the day that you can't take yourself away from it. It's almost like you become almost, uh, like, mentally and almost physically fixated on this thought to the point where it basically removes you from, I guess, whatever you were doing or, let's say, removes you from your sense of, I guess, like, like, uh, presence. And I don't think I've had anything like that before. Not that I can, like, instantly recall, but I've definitely had moments in my life, like, whether it be at work or at home, where I'm, like, I, I'm, I'm thinking about something so much that I just can't focus on what's in front of me. Like, let's say, like, the noisy, let's say in the analogy that I was using, like, the noisy part of my brain, the part, again, I say noisy part of my brain, I don't think there's any physicality here. I think it's just me psyching myself. Or, or me just, like, Attempting to analyze what's going on in my brain in ways that are that I understand. Think of it like data structures. You know, I'm I'm assigning a particular data structure or a particular struct that corresponds to what I think I'm feeling, a particular routine in terms of computer senses. Anyway. Oh, I don't know where I was going with that. Think. Okay, okay. Hold on. What was I thinking about that? Maybe. Okay, back to the analogy. I remembered it. It's almost like the noisy part of the brain, or the morty, the noisy part of my psyche, has been. Um, oh, that's cool. I've been here before, evidently. No, I don't want to go up. Why, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going back down. Okay. Um, almost like the noisy part of my brain has taken over, right? It's the point where the thing that, and I guess I assign it more of in terms of perspective. Like I will choose 
that I want to be focusing on a particular task. And that's the task that, let's say, the one side of my psyche focuses on. And I will choose a task that I don't want to focus on. And that's what I'm considering the noisy part. Well, the noisy part is focused on one task. The other part is focused on another. I guess in that way, maybe I shouldn't call it noisy. No noisy might be the, the wrong term to use. I don't really want to use the term noisy anymore. Because it almost feels like it's like not contributing in some way. I'm not not really sure. The let's call it the um the not as important part. The the, the I'm, okay, I'm just gonna call it the noisy part because I I can't think of what other term to, to to refer to it as. But the noisy part takes over while the focused part kind of is is like ah oh, well I give up whatever you you've won over. And then I get like distracted. Oftentimes for me, what'll happen is I think about the content that I do a lot. I love I love to stream and I like to be able to find like ways to be able to increase, like it, it make the experience better for not only me, but other people as well. And oftentimes I'll kind of daydream about it. I will get like, well, I'd love to do a certain certain thing or like I plan on doing the stream thing and I got to think about my cocktail stuff this week or whatever it may be. And, and now I can't work on stuff anymore. And so it detracts from my work. I feel like I'm less of a working individual and I want to feel like a working individual and I'm spending my time properly in terms of what I want to get out of my company work and what I want to put into the work for the company. Because it's a, it's a part of my existence now. It's just kind of how work is. And I like that. And it, it's a good thing. I feel very good about that. Some, pe some people don't, but that's something that's definitely worth talking about. Um, But, oh, you bastard. You bastard. Coming here, throwing your... Jizz juice at me. I don't appreciate it. Keep your jizz juice away from me. I don't like it. Uh, but yes, I think, although maybe it's not considered this male-adapted daydreaming thing, I have definitely uh, experienced, like, kind of intrusive thoughts, dare I call them daydreams, distracting me so completely for what I'm trying to focus on that, you know, I might as well, I might as well just walk away from my task completely. And oftentimes I do. What I will actually do is sometimes when I find that the intrusive thoughts are occurring, I will I will let them I'll, I'll let them have their day. I will take that as a moment to run to the bathroom. I will make myself some tea, make myself some coffee. I'll just walk outside for a moment because evidently, if these thoughts, this daydreaming is going to be so noisy and so annoying, then evidently it wants some of my time even for a little bit. And if I just appease it, if I appease that part of my mentality, eventually it goes away. And usually it doesn't take very long either. Um, usually it really does just take either an extended trip to the bathroom or the time it takes for me to brew tea or brew coffee for those thoughts to eventually subside and kind of become not as noisy, not as noisy as they were previously to the point where I can focus back on what I was doing and, and choose what I want to think about as opposed to not choose what I think about. I guess a question that I would have in terms of, I guess, the analysis of male adaptive daydreaming is that... If you suffer from male adaptive daydreaming from like let's say a clinical standpoint or like a diagnosable standpoint, do you choose it? Is it conscious? Is it subconscious? Is it something that you can, if you choose actively to walk away from, can you? Because if that is the case, if you can't, and that is a different description, then I do not have male adaptive daydreaming and I don't think I've actually ever experienced it. Except during forms where like maybe things blend together. I've had a couple of panic attacks before, so in that way I can't distract myself from a particular thought it's not really it doesn't really happen during the day so it's not really day daydreaming i don't know if it's male adaptive either because like i guess the male adaptive part of it is that if it's male adaptive that means you want to like focus on something it's adapting to a particular situation but it's not being conducive to the situation it's not providing a sort of benefits um that you would i guess the daydreaming would usually have might have gotten very analytical there but um i think we have to be you know there you go and a good deposit stuff. You kind of choose it, but it's like a movie that's running in the back of your mind. Okay. So I guess that's the daydream part of it, right? You, you can choose to daydream. And if the daydream kind of takes control, like you kind of, you decide, you are you think to yourself, you're like, I consent to a thought popping into my head. I'm going to let it exist for a while. Maybe it's a song. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something that's got occupying your attention, you know, like something. I think something that sometimes I can get kind of distracted on. And again, I am very open and honest about this stuff. Sometimes, like, sometimes, like, something, for lack of a better term, sexy will pop up in my mind. Like, I can't distract myself from it, so I gotta walk away for a little bit. And, so, and I don't know if that's, like, you know, you don't necessarily choose that stuff. And, like, sometimes I can choose to think about it. It's, it's nice to think about sexy things, you know? Um, but sometimes I don't. Sometimes, I'm like, I, this is really distracting me right now, and I don't want it to affect me. So I'm gonna walk away for a second. I'm gonna do something about it. Make some tea or coffee or otherwise. And then it winds up going away. Like, I don't really know. It's definitely like a, you know, maybe. 
And I guess technically you can choose to walk away from it. If the male adaptiveness is the fact that you, maybe you can initiate it, but you can't walk, too easily walk away from it, maybe I have. I don't know. I'm very, very, I guess, I'm very, very hesitant to say that I do or do not have certain things unless I feel like I can call it how I see it. Like, if male adaptive uh, daydreaming is something that is, like, there's the, the meaning to it is, like, really, really obvious. Like, male adaptive daydreaming, you break it down, and we did the anal analysis before. Maybe I do. But, like, I'm not a doctor, so how should I say? I don't know. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. In the terms that it's, like, male, male, I, I guess I'll, my closing thoughts on this are that if it's male adaptive, it almost feels like you don't necessarily have control over it. You can't turn it off when you want to. And sometimes I can't turn it off even when I want to, but sometimes I can. And more often than not, I can turn it off and I do want to turn it off. That's another important part there. If you want, like say, if you're feeling bad, I don't want to feel better, you're not gonna feel better. Unless like, you know, you completely change your state of being. Maybe you, you use a substance, you take a pill, you get a little high or something like that. You might feel better because, you know, your mind is operating a little bit differently. You now want to feel better, or you just don't have the capability to say you don't want to feel better, you know? It's all about the mind. Um, yeah, I would think, in terms of what my in my interpretation, I don't think I do, but, like, maybe. I don't know. That was a very, very interesting... That was a very interesting train of thought, and I appreciated that discussion. Thank you for bringing that up, Dom. I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed this mental journey that we just took together. I appreciate that. I love stuff like that. I like, I guess, reflecting on the conference a little bit more. When I'm ha when I was having this conversation with the one individual about like da like data collection and stuff like that, I felt very very comfortable to like continue to what not only talk about it but to continue talking about it. There was a piece of me that was like, not only do I feel okay talking about this, but I don't feel like we have to like stop talking about it. Like I'm more than happy to keep going about this, and I feel very comfortable about it. I don't ne I didn't necessarily feel like. I'm talking way too much about it. I'm bothering the other person or that I should stop talking about it because I should really be thinking about something else. Like it felt okay to think about that stuff. And that's like, that, going back to the community thing, that's the type of thing that feels really good about like human interaction and like very well-formed communities. It's really nice to kind of jump into a thought and somebody say like, oh, well, like my thoughts on that are different. And it's really cool to have in a community where people can be like, okay, well, that's, that's okay. You do have a different thought. Let's talk about it. You, you don't know what something is. Let's talk about it together. Let's all like go into this like go into this like open-minded together. Naturally, I'm not clinical. I am not a medical doctor, so or a therapist or anything like that. So I may not have that, let's say, academic perspective on it. But just because I don't know what I'm talking about doesn't mean that I can't speculate about it. Doesn't mean that I can't critically think about it. I think that's that's the beauty. That's the beauty of it. I feel like there was a large there was a portion of my life where there was so much. Um, I felt like there was almost like ridicule to people like myself who really wanted to think about that stuff because I didn't necessarily have the background in it. And I was like, okay, fine. I'll go to college so I have the right to talk about it. But by that logic, that means I only have the right to talk about things that are like engineering related or electricity related or computer related. But like I'm so interested in other things and I'm sure more people are. And like you shouldn't feel bad about that. You really shouldn't. You want to think about stuff. You want to critically think about something. It doesn't matter what your religion are. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is. It doesn't matter what your background is or the place of your birth. You should be able to think about it. And that's really beautiful. Actually, that brings me to another point in my tangent where there's an or there's a website out there called SciHub. S-C-I hyphen hub. That is attempting, the goal is to make all intellectual knowledge accessible to everybody. And essentially how the site functions is you can put in the link to any paper out there protected by like a paywall, such as like on uh, PubMed or NCBI or other like journals out there, like peer reviewed journals and stuff. Put the link in there that's blocked to you by a paywall. You put it into the link and it will open up for you. It has collected login information from uh, thousands of different people to be able to log into these websites and provide the information to you for free. You want to find a topic on quantum physics and it's backed by a paywall, go into this site, Put the URL there, and it'll open it up for you if if it's gotten there before and there's bandwidth to do it. And you can read it for free. It might be really, really above your pay grade, in which case you might need to do some studying, but you can pick it any topic you want to, whether it be like medical science and stuff like that. You have that access, and I am totally for that stuff. If I were, if I published a paper, and I personally have not published any papers, I haven't coped published any papers or anything like that but i know people who have published papers and at least the people in my circle if i were to ask them yo can i read your paper they're not gonna say yeah but you gotta pay me first and i feel like 
most people out there, if you did research on stuff, if you approach the person who wrote the paper, and actually this was a piece of advice that I read like on a forum somewhere, but like if you find a paper that looks like it was written by somebody, you really, really want to, you really, really want to read it, reach out to the people who authored it or co-authored it. Like the people who published the paper. Not, maybe not the people who published it, but the people who wrote the paper and ask them for a copy of it. Chances are they're not going to ask you for money. Because, like, I feel like anybody who vote goes into the field of research doesn't go into the field of research wanting to specifically make money off of it. If you got that far to get a PhD, yeah, you were probably hoping to get paid by whatever company picks you up. But I feel like you weren't hoping to make bank on the papers you were publishing. I could be wrong about that. But if it were me, I would want to be able to, like, like, like if I published a paper and somebody out there was, like, putting it behind a paywall, I'd encourage people to pop on the stream or DM me or, like, open a conversation with me because I don't want you to feel like you have to, like, be walled behind a paywall and pay for it. That's stupid to me. The knowledge that exists in my head, if I can share it to other people and inspire more minds, then that's free, dude. That's great. If I can benefit, like, and I benefit from that, right? Because if I can offer you my wisdom, if I even have it, you can offer me the wisdom that you have. The wisdom you may think is not a lot, but that's the thing, that's, in that's intellect, that's not wisdom. Wisdom, I think, is about using the knowledge that you already have, using the intellect you already have and applying it. And you can use, if you have an intellect, if you have knowledge of critical thinking, you can apply that anywhere. If you have knowledge about what you know in the medical field, you can totally apply it in the engineering field. You can apply that, that's wisdom, I think. You could be a child, who hasn't even gone through their general education, but you know a thing or two from personal experience about, let's say, like, what feels good in the home that you grew up in. You've got intellect about that, and the wisdom is being able to apply that, realizing that, like, hey, that kid over there doesn't seem very happy, and I know he's talked about his parents being separated before. My parents aren't separated, and I'm kind of happy. Maybe there's a connection there. Go up and say, yo, I want to invite you to over to my house. Let's hang out. And they have a great time there because, you know, you have a happy family or something like that where they don't. That thought, if it were to occur in a child's mind, somebody who doesn't even know how to read or write yet, that's beautiful. That's wisdom. That's applying the knowledge. I like, I, I, know, I get it. The, the analogy might not be perfect. That's a, such a cool thing. Um, but if there was something scary in the way of approaching that kid with the divorced parents, like, social constructs or standards or a wall separating this country from the other one or this skin color from the other one then you deprive those ideas of flourishing now granted that is to say this is not this is not a biased wall not only can the good ideas and the good thoughts occur from critical thinking and wisdom and stuff like that the bad stuff can as well but there's i, I don't know that, that goes beyond i guess the point of that but like people have critical thinking on their shoulders to be able to think about the morality of stuff and the ethical stuff of whatever Again, more critical thinking. And that's a very, very, very amusing thing to me. And I think it's very, very cool to talk about. And I think that, that the beauty of it is that people should be able to talk about it. You shouldn't feel like you can't talk about anything. Maybe you, feel, maybe you should feel that you shouldn't talk about certain things to certain people, especially when you're going to hurt them. Like, you know, if somebody feels really, really bad about, like, talking about, like, let's say they're, they're vegan and they really don't want to talk about killing animals because it makes them feel really bad it makes them feel difficult you shouldn't force the conversation of meat eating on this person you could if they're open to talk about it and be able to share the perspective of a vegan versus a carnivore versus a pescatarian versus a vegetarian and they're open to that then let the conversation flourish um but if they don't want it then don't force it on them like if you don't want to talk about computer architecture we don't have to talk about computer architecture i'm just thinking i'm just thinking about the stuff that has happened during this stream so far that's fine that is okay but that doesn't necessarily mean that i shouldn't talk about it at all i think i'm trying to get a little better at like i mean i don't think i talk about very like hot takes on stream anyways but like if i'm gonna encroach upon that like like political ter territory and stuff like that i'd like to be able to like disclaim that like hey if you're not cool with this stuff if talking about Minecraft, if playing Minecraft really is, like, 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 lethally affecting you in some way, then I encourage you to please remove yourself from the stream. Please remove yourself from the YouTube video and VOD, because this is not the right place for that. I play other games. You will have another opportunity to join the conversation. Um, but if I, if, you know, but if I was, like, I only stream one game literally all the time, I'm not preventing you from going to another streamer so that you can't get, can't get hurt by this stuff. If you like the pain... Then feel free to stick around, because it will continue. 
But if that's not what you're into, if you're not that kind of person, which some people aren't, then you have the freedom you have the freedom of your choice here. And that is okay. Anyway, I came up to the surface. I'm gonna deposit all of my stuff into my system over here. I don't think I have power. Do I have steam being generated just yet? I don't think I do. I don't I don't have power generated just yet. But I'm hang on the screen for a second, and I'm gonna go. Make yourself a cocktail. Actually, what I'm gonna do... Yeah, no, I'm gonna make a cocktail. That's a good idea. All right, let's change things up. I'm gonna go make a very quick cocktail. It's called Negroni. Let's make it happen. First, what I have to do is go back here. I have to go back to my bar setup. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Now it's working. I don't need to do any more than this. So I'm just gonna step back here and make us something. Yeah. Hi there, I'm Cameron. I'm a mixologist as well. I like to make cocktails. I'm gonna move this stuff out of the way. I haven't I've been away for the holidays, so I really haven't set things up yet, so I'm not <laughs> I'm not it's a total mess over here, uh, but I'm gonna make one anyway. It's very, very simple. You can build it in a glass. You can gra grab any glass you want to. I'm gonna use one that's easily to stir in. And I'm gonna add three components. I'm gonna add equal parts Campari, gin, and sweet vermouth. I got sweet vermouth in my fridge. And what we tend to do with cocktails like this is we'll mix the more expensive parts uh, later in the drink so that we don't screw things up. I have a liquor right here somewhere just for me. Um, oh, there you are. Put it back here back behind the plum wine. I'm not necessarily going to do it in that order because um, this is the first ingredient that I grabbed and I wanted to utilize it. I'm going to add about two ounces. Uh, I want a thick uh, I'll, I'll do a small one. I don't need that. Let me grab an ice cube from my freezer. I should also do that first. I'm mixing it over ice. Usually what you can do is you put this in a stirring glass um, and you would stir it first in the glass and then strain it out. I don't need it. I have to do that. I recognize that that's one technique. But I'm going to do something completely different. Put a little ice in there. Add a single ounce of sweet vermouth. Here we go. I put that away back in my fridge, all nice and cozy in there. Sweet vermouth is nice. Uh, our Antica formula, which is the one that seems to be really popular. Um, oh, that's not working. What do we want? Put that here. Push it back. I need to reorganize my fridge over here. I'm too fast. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, my cocktail onions won't fit in the fridge, damn it. That's okay. Huh. Now it's working. I'm gonna take some gin. This is gonna be a nice Negroni, so I'm gonna use some, some of the botanist gin. Just a single ounce of that. Put it inside. It's gonna be lovely. And what's next? The missing ingredient. Don't shout all at once. It's Campari. Or some other, like, bitter aperitif. I think what I'm gonna do, knowing that it's bitter, a bitter component here, I'm gonna use something different in my Negroni and make a coffee Negroni. Instead of using Campari, the aperitif in question is going to be a Mr. Black Amaro, which is gonna be have some bitter orange notes in addition to some coffee vibes. I have to get this thing open. I'm gonna add an ounce of that as well. Equal parts, all these ingredients. It's super duper easy. And then I'm gonna change my lighting back up and stir it up my desk. So it's easy to do. I only came back here because this is where all my cocktail reagents are. At my bar. I have a bar. I got this new bar spoon that I bought over the holiday. Great. Looks awesome. I'm gonna make my way back over here. Readjust my lighting and whatnot. I don't have any shoes on. You might hear me squeaking across the floor. Readjust things over here. There we go. 
take my levy back. I wish I had voice commands for this. I don't have voice commands for the particular yeah. orientations. I get a wheeze. Oh, that is very blue. What are you doing? It's not good. Oh, no, no. That's the... No. Ah. Ah. There we go. That's the right one. I gotta take off. I got work in a few hours. Oh, go for it, Tom. Appreciate you hanging out. Absolutely excellent. Excellent discussion. Oh, wait. I gotta go back here. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Couldn't hear things. Excellent, excellent discussion we had. I very much appreciate it. This is my coffee Negroni. It's got equal parts coffee Amaro, gin, which is a little bit more, eh, and then um, sweet vermouth. I'm going to give that a bit of a stir. It's going to dilute it a little bit more. Usually you would strain this out, but I kind of want to keep it cold, and I want to have uh, not much space between my mouth and the bottom of the glass. Ooh, that's delightful. The, um, the Amaro, the, um, what do you call it? The, ooh, back to the game. The, oh, wow. The Carpana Antica, which is the sweet vermouth that we use in this case. As it's almost kind of bubblegummy. It's got a very nice fruity note to it. I like it. It seems to got a lot of complexity, according to other bartenders that I know and mixologists. It's good. It pairs super duper well with the coffee amaro it's got a very sweet it's like it's just like a sweet coffee it's almost like you made a like got a latte from starbucks but there's no milk in it it's just got that sweetness and it's a little bit of orange sweetness oh my god i got so freaked out i just got so freaked out from the minecraft music i gotta take that off this playlist which one is this this is 11 i need to remove 11 from this playlist because i it freaks me out every single time i listen to it uh, remove from album, remove from playlist. All right, all right. <laughs> I have a specifically a Minecraft playlist because I don't find that the music plays enough when I'm playing Minecraft for me to truly enjoy it. So, all right, I'm gonna think about what I can do with all this stuff. Algae, I can't do anything with. I'm going to trash it. Let's trash that. I don't need it. Mushrooms are nice, but I don't really want them. I came up because I needed more torches. I realized I have wood on me. I didn't need to do that. I'm going to take these saplings and turn them into plant balls. I have four persimmons in there. That's not right. Let's make these tree saplings into plant ball. Nope, they're not going to... Why aren't you doing that? I thought you turned into plant balls if I compressed you. Oh, I need eight of them, don't I? I need eight, don't I? Yeah, I need eight. All right, well, the persimmons return. The persimmons done do their return, and that's okay. And you know what I just realized? I just started sipping this cocktail, and I really gotta, I really gotta take a pee-pee break. So I'm gonna go and do that real quick, so I'm not, like, doing the dance in my chair a little bit. I'll be back in just a quick moment. I hope the break screen doesn't look disgusting, because I haven't worked on it in months. So I'll be back in a moment. Welcome back, everybody. I say that because I returned. Not because you returned. Because I did. I was able to catch my dearest before she went to bed. I was very happy about that. I got to kiss her goodnight. Except that doesn't usually happen. Because she just started a new chapter in her life. The final chapter of PT school. <laughs> She's getting there. I'm so proud of her. <clears throat> Apparently my volume was okay, so I'm going to continue with my volume. I just want to make sure I'm not waking anybody up. Oh, what am I doing down here? So I'm trying to clear up my inventory a bit. Go back down for some more mining. Move my mic even closer to my face. Trying to figure out what the best angle for this thing is. Because I got this new mic arm. And I don't know how things sound. So it's an iterative process. After the stream ends, I'll take a listen. See if things sound okay. If not, and it just ain't working that way. Then, um... We'll try it again, I guess. Put the mushrooms in there. I can put the saplings in there. I don't think I'm pining for space right now. So I should be okay. System's kind of cool. We've all seen it before. Process all of my ores and stuff. And it processes it pretty well. Does a really good job. Totally configurable. It's great. And I love it. Reminds me of the engineering mentality that I have. All that stuff. Anything in there in particular? This is not going to be filtered out. Because I've never seen that before. It's just talc in black granite. Graphite ore I've seen. Yellow limonite, malachite. This is all... I guess I haven't seen talc at all. Black granite, I'm pretty sure. This is a bizzle stone. I've seen that before. 
new stuff. Chip Jasper I haven't seen before. That'll wind up getting crushed into Jasper dust. See this other stuff here. I see an exquisite amber. That'll get... That's good. That can be turned into a lens. If an amber lens is a thing. Let me see. Exquisite ambers can be made into amber lenses. Amber rods, which probably aren't useful. Amber lenses can be used to create ASIC wafers. Cool. And the alkalis disc activated. And can that be made with any other lens? Amber lens. Amber lens. Topaz lens. Interesting. Now, I wonder if the topaz lens can also be made for, used for ASICs. ASICs wafers. Okay. But they have to be in Naquata doped wafers, and I don't have access to Naquata yet. ASICs can be created with only that. So, and ASICs are used for what? Naquata is on the moon. I need a rocket ship to get there. Made in ASICs, naturally. You made to use ASICs naturally. Or, guess, not ASICs, ASOCs. They're different. As opposed to an ASIC. ASIC, which would be an application-specific integrated circuit. A SOC is an application-specific app, application system on chip, probably, probably an application system on chip, or advanced system on chip. I don't know. That could create nanoprocessors. Nanoprocessors are plenty, and quantum processors. Excellent. You probably didn't update. You're taking a bunch of cobblestone in there. The cobblestone is all going to be compressed. Compressed cobblestone can also be combined with, I think, graphite at some point, and that will be able to create, um, um, really, bedrockium ingots. Oh, I don't need the charcoal. The charcoal doesn't need to be there. Any charcoal that goes in this system, I'm pretty sure gets routed to the storage area for charcoal specifically. Flawless green sapphire, that's pretty good. You like that stuff? Any more stuff I haven't seen before? And the chipped amber, which I think I scanned already. Yeah. Always nice to get a little bit of magic points for that. I haven't done magic stuff in a while. Could go back and do that. I don't really want to, though. I've yet another bow. Those are cool, I guess. Um, I want to see how the fertilizer system down there is going, because... Give it a couple of... What's coming in here? I see a bizzel block and basalt cobblestone, which is good. Like I, I think those look pretty. So I filter those out specifically, because I like to build them. Blackstone. Blackstone is nice. Some chupacabra meat. Let me see if I have more chupacabra stuff in here. Chupa. I got some raw chupacabra meat. I will take that. And I will cook it up. And yes. What I'll do instead is I'll just put them down here in the furnace system. I should really have a I should really have a another port up there that directly throws things into the furnace. And then like returns them? I wonder, can I? I don't think I can. I was trying to think whether or not I can take an item, put it into the furnace, and mark it in some way, and then it comes out marked the same way. So that like, I can use, like, paint or whatever to put things into the furnace and then back into the chest next to, like, back into the chest that I put it into without taking it. I, I don't really know. I can put my trooper copper meat in there. It'll be smelted and distributed equally among all of these guys. Cooked. And if I remember that those exist, I'll come back for it. What other meats do I have? I just want like I want meat to take with me. Do I have any hydra meat still? No. How about chicken? I got a piece of cooked chicken here. I'll eat that. No need to take up more space. Beef. Beef. Pork. Got some cooked pork chops. That's good. Yum. I'll take a couple of that. And I emptied out all my stuff. I'll go check and see how the steam system is doing, making sure that it's actually generating. Steam right now. It looks like it is. It is. So, power system is currently creating power. Currently creating steam, rather. And it is fill up. This is good. Y'all are on. You're 137. You're generating steam. You guys are both generating steam. Excellent. Which is exactly what we want you to do. Stay full. Stay thirsty, my boilers. Stay thirsty. We're actually still working on saplings and stuff. So, that's good. There's a variety of different things to consume fuel of. And that hopefully makes everything better. Sometimes it's a little slower of a start, but it's not as slow as it would be if I just churned all those saplings into there. I found previously, previously what I tried is it would be saplings first, then wood, then charcoal. Charcoal lasts a hell of a long longer than both of them. Saplings last barely any time. And I thought maybe I can squeeze a little bit more juice out of them 
before I have to go into the charcoal reserve, which arguably is the most precious um, precious fuel that I have, unless I make compressed charcoal, which would be more precious than that, or some other like upper level fuel that's burnable. But like, uh, it, well, it wasn't. Uh, it, it wasn't working very well. I found that I wasn't, by the time that stacks and stacks and stacks of saplings were used, I wasn't gaining any steam at all, which was not good. That's not what I was going for. I want to be able to use it to create steam. And you have to get to a certain heat level first before the steam can be created. And apparently, even with all the saplings in the world, through all of the distribution system, it wouldn't get it hot enough to produce steam. So instead, we send it all in there at once. The charcoal... I thought I heard a machine struggling. Let me check that. Um, instead of it struggling, we put all of it in there at once. And any usually, the saplings will get a little bit taken off in the beginning. But once those things reach temperature, they will actually start contributing to the steam count. Okay, so I actually used all the... Wow, I used all the ashes. That's great. Any more ashes that come through are going to be filtered out into the system here. And used accordingly. Actually, I don't have... Oh. I don't have ashes going into this thing here. I should, though. Oh, I can do that. Let me go optimize real quick. Love to optimize on things. What sends it down here? I see that cable, that pipe up there. Let's take a look-see here. All right. I see a pipe going through the floor. The pipe going through the floor is connected to the black here. The black accepts ashes and calcium, but ashes don't know where to go. I need to create myself some ashes, or get some of those ashes. Ashes, ashes, we all fall down. Or something like that. Ash. I have soda ash and potash. Previously, I was taking ash and I was centrifuging it, but I don't do that anymore, I don't think. Right? No. I took ashes from here and I put it up there. I need to get myself some ashes. What can I use for ashes? I can take wood and burn it into ashes, I'm pretty sure, right? Or not. <coughs> what can I burn into ashes? Ugh, I'm like blanking. I should know this. Paper. Ash. Ash. Aces, aces. Be all bow down. Ashes. Ashes can be created from a variety of different things. What do we got? Coke oven. I can put 16 in there in a pyrolyze oven. Don't want to do that. Chemical reactor. That doesn't seem very self-sustaining. Burn things. What do I burn? I can burn... I can take dark ashes and turn them into that. Dark ashes are formed from something. Let's see how much luck I have with this. I can extract stuff from charcoal and a variety of other things and a fluid extractor, but that's not sustainable. Pulverizing. Arc furnace. I can use the arc furnace to create ash. An arc furnace. Centrifuge. 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 Where do I get dark ashes from? I used to remember how to get dark ashes. I think they come out from a pyrolyse oven. Or otherwise. Coke. Pyrolyse, if I could. They are formed when the implosion compressor does its job, so I could go upstairs and blow some shit up. Blast furnace. I can centrifuge blaze powder. So technically, if I had if I had a blaze farm, I would be able to I'd be able to create dark ashes and sulfur. Sulfur I really don't need that much of. I can also take basalt. Oh, if I take basalt. And I put it in groups of 16. I... Didn't I just find some basalt? I think I did. I think I have some basalt in here somewhere. Basalt dust. Basalt. Oh no, you turn off. It'll turn back on again. Basalt dust. I have basalt cobblestone, basalt, smooth basalt. But if I turn that into... Let's take the basalt dust and do some analysis. I like the way basalt looks, and it's a nice, cool material... But basalt dust itself can be used to create magnesium, olivine, calcite, flint, and dark ashes. Dark ashes can be used to make ashes. Ashes are good. And carbon. Carbon is very useful. Flint dust can be centrifuged out. I think previously I didn't do this because I didn't like flint. I didn't want to take flint and grind it up. But actually, I should get flint. Flint creates silicon. And flint gives me oxygen, silicon and oxygen. And I have a lack, I have a ton of flint here. I can take the amount of flint that I have, and if I really, really need to use it for something, I can put it in a different barrel. 
I can also grind it up because I don't really have a good oxygen source. There's a couple of different things that can get oxygen, but I don't really have a good source of oxygen. But if every th single thing I get flint-wise goes here, and can I, whoops, can I create flint? If I really need flint, I can go and find flint. What can flint be used for? In pieces, I can use it for tools and whatnot. I can use it for guns. I can use it for this stuff. I feel like I usually don't need to go out and get flint. And I do know there's a tool in, in this mod pack where you can mine gravel and it just always drops flint. And I don't remember what tool that is, but I know I can look it up. So I needed to... Oh, okay, this is for coal balls. And that's for artificial di industrial diamonds, but I don't need art don't industrial diamonds. I have them already. And flint for compressed coal balls. Yeah, the same thing. Assembler. Chanter. I don't think I would need that. I honestly don't think I need all this flint. I think flint should be ground up and and macerated. So I'm going to change that. Flint, if you pop into my system, you're going to go here. You're going to go over here. You're going to get grounded up. Get ground up and turn into flint dust and all that stuff. Flint. Do I have more of you? Oh, no, you're gone. Come back, please. Something's going to pop into this thing. Okay. Or I can just stand at that. Oh, it just did. Okay. I have player sensors and sensors on this chest up here that will activate these things if necessary. Oh, I also have the talc. What can I do talc? I forgot to take a check of that. Talc. Can we use to create talc naturally? Magnesium, silicon. Uh, there's 12 oxygen per talc. Talc can be used for an electrolyzer. Brewing machine for stuff and create lubricant if I needed to. But that's a good source of oxygen. Do I have any talc in my system already? Talc? I have talc powder. Okay, so evidently talc and its powder form get processed. And I don't think there's any piece of talc that needs to be, like, optimized on. Because, like, I can get the magnesium, silicon, hydrogen, O2. Yeah, okay. Th that should just be passed to the system normally. I need to do any sort of modification. This is fine. Flint's gonna get passed through and completely destroyed. No more, no more flinted over here. If I need flint, I'll take, I'll take a few stacks of the flint, all the flint that I have left, and I'm gonna put it in a barrel upstairs, and all the one that's left over here. Any additional flint will wind up being ground out. I'll put it in a barrel, and that's up here somewhere. Here we go. Spare barrel? Anybody has spare barrel? Turn on. Barrel? Barrel. Barrel? Barrel. Oh, the talc was supposed to go in there. I completely missed that. The salt. And I think what I should do is... I don't really focus on the building part of it. If I need basalt, I go get basalt. That's, that's fine. So I think what I'll do is I'll make sure that everything basalt related gets... Whoops. Oh no, go back, go back. I need to upgrade my storage at some point too, but I just haven't found the time to make that a goal. Alright, give me that. Give me this stuff here. Let's see. Basalt cobblestone winds up coming in. Smooth basalt can be done like that. Um, Can I grind up smooth basalt? It can be made into basalt dust. Basalt dust can, be, can do stuff. Basalt cobblestone can also be ground up into basalt powder. Basalt dust. Currently, what do I do with basalt? I know... The fact that there's smooth basalt in here means that I probably have it filtered out in my system somewhere. Black granite cobblestone. I see andesite and stuff up there. Basalt would usually pass on through and do what? Abyssal stone gets... furnished. All this stuff gets furnished. I think it just goes along. I think it just does. Well, I think this stuff should be macerated. So, I will add... I'm gonna need to add another diamond pipe there somewhere. Because I have all this fish and stuff. Black granite. Basalt cobblestone will now be added here. And it will be macerated. And I will put basalt cobblestone, basalt cobblestone, smooth basalt, and talc there. Right, what are you working on? You're working on a bunch of flint that just came in? Excellent, good for you. That actually takes a lot of time. A lot of effort, right? Pulverization, it takes 20 seconds to grind up flint? Really? Is it that hard a material? 
It's a good source of oxygen and silicon. So I think it is worth it. All right. The system will take care of that. And I don't have to worry about that right now. Okay. What do I do now? Probably play for like another like... Oh, I've been on for like two and a half hours. That's incredible. Well, wow. I was not expecting to go that long. I don't have a goal for what else to do. This is good. You know what? This is this is a good place to stop. I think this is a this is a nice old place to call it a stopping point. I was gonna go back down into the mines, but I'd probably be down there for like another hour or so. This, this is good. One little mine trip. I was able to let's see, what was we able to talk about? We talked about some philosophical stuff. That's good. It's things that go on in the mind. Talked about CES a little bit. If there's more questions about what happened at CES, I'm happy to talk about it. I was I was there and it was a really, really cool time. And I got to see a bit of stuff. Maybe not everything, but it was really, really exciting. And I had a really, really good time. And so with that, I think I'm done for the night. I think this is this is very, very productive. And I'm cool with that. Even if it was even if we didn't really make much goals. It's not about focusing on the futility, just about having a good time. In any case, it was fun, and that's where I'm going to end this. Thank you, everybody, for coming along. This is very fun. I like playing Minecraft. It's a bit of a comfort game of mine. I get to just kind of talk about anything. It's the fun stuff. Why stream under a just chatting section when you can play Minecraft and also chat about whatever you want to? Is there a lack of visibility there? Sure. Are people actually going to pop on? No, probably not. It's like this own little bubble that we have all to ourselves. And I think there's some benefit here. To any case, thank you everybody so much for popping along. And I guess I'll see you guys on Wednesday where we're mixing up some drinks. I have literally no idea what we're doing yet, but hopefully I can take tomorrow to figure that out. So no matter where you are in the world at large, whether the sun is shining where you are, whether the moon is shining, if it's the day, night, otherwise, I've been across a couple time zones in the past week or so, I understand. And no matter where you are, may it be a beautiful one, so long, everybody. Bye.